Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. There were many different creepy things that occurred around my little brother. Let's call him Time, a nickname he has. Let's start off by first stating our mother is a very cruel and evil woman. I don't want to get too into it, but if you have read or heard about a book called A Child Called It, then that pretty much shows how she treated us. She had eight kids, but for some reason only treated time and myself like garbage. Probably because we share the same dad while the others have a different dad. Anyway, at a very early age, time would panic every time the sun started going down. We used to have to stay in the unfinished garage, no windows, no AC, no heat. We shared a bunk bed with very shitty mattresses. Time is four years younger than myself, and like I stated, he was terrified of the dark. One night my mother had locked us in the garage for the next three or four days. She was upset because I stole food from the kitchen to feed Time and myself, since she didn't allow us to eat with the rest of the family. I stole those zebra cake snack cakes. She hadn't fed us in a couple days and we were so hungry. We normally had a bucket to use the bathroom in and a gallon jug of water and that was it. Anyway, I heard Time sniffling as Mom locked the door. I jumped down from the top bunk to look at him. Are you okay? It's only for a couple days. I'm sorry I shouldn't have taken those snack cakes, I said softly. He just shook his head. He didn't really talk much. Mostly he spoke in broken sign language. He made the sign for Cookie, which threw me off, but I hopped up into my bunk and grabbed the two Oreos I had for him every night. I stole a pack a while back and they were getting stale, but I always made sure he had them. I handed them to him and he smiled. He always took his time eating them. I went to hop back into bed, but I noticed him staring at the garage door. What is it? I asked. His eyes widened and he shook his head. No, he whimpered. Then he made the sign for scared. I hugged him. I won't let mom hurt you. I promised. I always made sure to make her more mad so she didn't hurt him. No, he said and made the sign for monster. I blinked a few times and said, there's no monsters, remember? Yoshi cleared them all out. Time loved Yoshi from the Mario games. So, every time he got scared, I said Yoshi would protect him. It worked for almost everything. Just then, something smacked hard against the garage door, making us both jump. No! yelled Time. It's back! It was probably just a bird. Birds get confused when it gets dark out. I said. It did happen often. Normally, it was the window in the living room, but they could easily hit the garage door as well. Time shook his head. It comes at night, every night. I was starting to get scared myself. What was he talking about? I laid down on the floor next to his bunk. Okay, I'll sleep right here so nothing can get you. I said, he threw a pillow down to me, which brought a smile to my face. We were always there for each other. I reached over and turned off the dying lamp that sat on the floor. It barely had light to it, but it was better than nothing. Pretty soon I could hear time whimper again. I grabbed the emergency flashlight I kept under his bunk and turned it on. It was dim normally, but if I clicked it twice, it had a bright strip of light down the side to light up the whole garage. I sat it on the floor sitting up so the whole room glowed. A shiver ran down my spine. Why is it so cold tonight? It's July, I asked, pulling my quilt down from the top bunk. I glanced at Time, who was focused on the far corner of the garage. What is it? But I was cut off by a loud boom within seconds after Mom hit the door that went into the house. Quiet down in there, was basically what she said. Now I was frightened. No way was that a bird, and now I know it wasn't Mom. Hungry, Time said, sitting straight up in his bunk. I know, buddy, I'll get us some food once Mom takes her sleepy meds. No, he's hungry. This stopped me dead. Woohoo! was all that came out. Time stared at the garage door. He wants in, this panicked me. Never had I felt so scared. I hopped up and shone the light over to the garage. Nothing was in the room with us, but I could see something moving around by the crack of the door. The boom. It tried to open the door. That's why I could see out of it now. The metal lock had stopped it, but the door was old. The lock was old. This didn't look good. It was probably a homeless guy trying to get in. I looked back at my little brother and put my finger to my lips. He nodded in understanding. 
I pulled the little pocket knife my dad had given me out. If he stuck his fingers through the door crack, I'd cut him. My heart was punting in my ears, but I knew if I told Mom, she would punish us worse and call us liars. I really didn't even think about telling her at the time. I heard this weird screeching noise as I edged closer to the door. A lump stuck in my throat. What made a sound like that? A raccoon? This thought made me feel a little better, but something in my gut said whatever was on the other side was dangerous. I looked over to the lock and noticed a roll of duct tape next to it. That might help. I quickly and quietly pulled a piece. It was way louder than I expected. I froze as I heard whatever was on the other side run slash hop to the other side of the door. Did I scare it? I ripped it off and stuck it around the lock. I'm not sure if it would help at all, but I did feel a little better. Then what sounded like nails on a chalkboard rang out. It lasted for what felt like forever, but really was less than a minute. Time squeaked, but buried his head in his blanket to stifle it. I ran back to my brother and hopped into his bunk with him. What was that? I said as soft as I could. Time grabbed the flashlight and turned it off. Monster, he said. Why'd you turn the light off? I asked, a bit alarmed. He shrugged. He don't like it, he said. Then he signed, angry. I didn't know what to think. How do you know that? I asked. He didn't answer for a while, but soon he said, talks to me every night. This really freaked me out. What does he say? Time fumbled with the flashlight. Wants in, he finally said. Then he pointed to himself. At first I thought he meant inside the garage, but then it hit me. Is, is it a demon or ghost? I asked, my body shaking all over. He shrugged and said, Monster, a monster wanted my brother. These words echoed through my head. Curiosity took a hold of me. Have you seen it? What does it look like? He turned the flashlight on dim so I could see him better and signed scary, tall, nasty. We really didn't know sign language entirely, so a lot of what he signed was broken. There was no way this was happening. Bang, bang, it hit the garage again. I was hoping Mom had taken her sleep meds and passed out already or we would be in bigger trouble if we survived this. Time grabbed my arm and I looked back at him. He whimpered, in, monster trying. I didn't know what to do, so we just sat there, hoping it wouldn't get in. I must have passed out because when I opened my eyes, light was starting to poke in through the garage door. Time was still asleep. I softly got out of the bed and went to the door to the house. I used my pocket knife to slip the lock open and peeked out. It was still very early. Everyone was still asleep and our stepdad must already be at work. I crept out and went straight for the front door first. I held my breath as I slowly opened the door and peered out. Nothing was there. I closed the door behind me as I walked over to the garage. There were a bunch of dents in the door and now I knew why. Tears ran down my face. It was real. That wasn't even the worst of it. On the ground next to the door were huge footprints. It looked like dinosaur footprints. I couldn't believe it. Four toed, giant dinosaur footprints. What was I looking at? I had never seen anything like it. I remembered from Jurassic Park how the T Rex's prints were, and these were very similar. Not exact, but it was the closest I could think of. There was no way a dinosaur just tried to get into our garage, though, right? I shook the idea from my head. This wasn't possible. The strange sounds it made, how it talked to time, this was something way strange. I quickly went back inside and into the kitchen, stealing food that wouldn't be missed like I always had to do. I would take baggies and fill them with cereal, cookies, or whatever was open that wouldn't be noticeable. Then I ran back to the garage. Putting the lock back was the trickier part, but within minutes I had got it. I woke time up and gave him some food. He smiled and ate happily. After a few minutes he asked, Monster gone? I nodded. Yes, it went away. How many times has it been here? I asked. All those dents were not from last night. There was no way. He paused a moment, swallowed his food, and held up his hand, showing me five fingers. Five times? In a row, or... He held up three fingers. Last night makes three in a row. A shiver ran down my spine again. What was this thing, and why does it want my brother? First of all, the stories I'm about to tell are not just one but two of the most strange, terrifying, and paranormal things that ever happened to me in my life that I will never forget. Both of my stories these creatures I encountered were totally different from each other. 
First encounter happened when I was hunting with some friends back in September of 2011. The other encounter occurred at a cabin in October of 2014. The two stories I will be telling are true, but names are changed for confidentiality. Now let's get started. My name is Hudson. I live towards the Glacier National Park just northwest of Montana, where I grew up most of my life living on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, the place where you will hear of scary tales of Goat Man, Stories of campers going missing in the middle of the woods where the stick Indians come out and take people away in the night. Getting back on track to my story. I would describe myself as six a two medium build, beard. Being just a mixed race and having very light skin living on the reservation all my life, I hung around a lot with my cousin Dan. Dan was two years younger than me, liked sports, was very good at basketball, and played for the high school team. We did a lot of hiking and hunting together, also a bit of drinking, smoking weed, chasing women, and just kicking it with the boys every now and then. My cousin introduced me to his two friends for the first time out on a hunting trip back in 2008. Their names were Big Tom and Mouse. Big Tom was just a big silly guy who liked talking about football and would always start singing to the country music playing on the radio, sitting in the front passenger seat in the truck. We would drive down the highway country roads and he would crack open a cold one. Mouse was five foot six, wore glasses, and had what you would call a short man complex. He always had to get competitive over who's the best at what all the time. Later, down the road on my own, I also started getting into different varies of hunting wild game as well, like ducks and grouses bird hunting, to varmint trapping, and learning how to make coyote hides. I would always go for the more exotic type hunting rifles and guns because I use them for the more efficient accuracy purposes, guess you can say. I would carry a Remington 7600 pump action 30, 06 rifle. The other guys just carried bolt action rifles. Sometime in September of 2011, and we're all in our early to mid 20s at the time, and it was beginning rifle season that day. I picked up my cousin at his house in my white 1995 Ford Bronco with two big light bars on top when I like to use for spotlighting sometimes. On our way up, we picked up Big Tom and Mouse and were all trying to decide what place we want to go to do some hunting for the day. Big Tom suggests we go out by his uncle's place that is just 43 miles north out of town. As we get about 30 miles out of town, we came to a dirt road where there's nothing but the flats and hills, a few old-time grain bins and same solar panels and oil rig pumps you see out in the distance. As we came up to an old radar base on the road, we pass a green and silver strip Dodge Ram Charger. What appeared to be two older-looking guys came into view. We tried to wave, but the two guys just gave us hysterical look on their faces as we drove by them. After making it to Big Tom's uncle's place, he goes in to check to see if he's home first, just to be sure to let him know we're just going to do some hunting around his area. Big Tom warned us about his uncle and said that he can be a bit of a loony tune at times. As we were getting ready and geared up to hunt, Big Tom comes out and let us know his uncle wasn't home and that it would be okay if he didn't show up any time. Big Tom was saying he had to go really bad all day, and luckily his uncle had outhouse just outside his place. We start to walk into what's probably about 200 acres of forest and in creek that run through it just behind Big Tom's uncle's place. We decide to split up in twos. Tom and Mouse head out together. Me and my cousin Dan start to follow the creek all the way up. Then we made a plan to all meet up with Big Tom and Mouse down the trail. As me and Dan walk about two miles into the forest, we come across two white-tailed bucks fighting for dominance. Dan and me start to get down on our knees and belly crawl. Taking our time, we start to approach the deer closer and closer. They were about ten yards into the brush. Me and Dan take the shot. We kill a deer each and wait for Big Tom and Mouse to show up. As me and Dan start to walk further more into the brushes and just around the bushes, we were startled by some birds. Right there in front of us was a horse. It looked weird like it was standing stiff. We approached the horse, realizing it wasn't moving, and it appeared to be hunched over a log. As we walk around the animal and let's just say what we saw wasn't a very pretty sight to look at. The rear end was torn wide open, and they were buzzards all over the place. I didn't see any other wounds on the dead animal, and I couldn't help but notice the tail was braided. Big Tom and Mouse show up, and we tell them about the dead horse and show them as well. We crack a joke and said our friend Mouse could crawl inside up into it and make a bed for the night. 
It was getting late. We started to quarter up me and Dan's deer. We found some good long pointy sticks laying on the ground that we used to poke throw each front and hind quarter and carry them over our shoulders. Finally getting on the road, we found some tracks that went into the forest behind Big Tom's uncle's place. I turn only my light bars on while driving through a creepy dark forest at night. With my light bars on brighter than hell, we spot some porcupines in the brushes. I reached into the back of back my Bronco and take out my laser-sighted crossbow. I loaded a bolt, put my sighting on it, used the lace to aim and shoot it. I retrieve, wrap it up, and throw it in the back with the rest of the quartered deer. While leaving from there, we start getting up little ways, all talking and joke until, wham! Something runs up, hits the side of my Bronco, and we all jumped. I was driving and said, oh, what the fuck was that? We rolled down the windows to look around. Big Tom even pointed his 44 Magnum outside of the car. We looked around a bit but didn't see anything, so we just headed out after a while. A few days later, I told one of my other friends, who's kind of a conspiracy theorist. He said a guy named Victor, who lives on the reservation, told him about something called a witch's braid that would appear on horses overnight. He mentioned a story where the woman thought it was cute that something would braid her horse's tail hair at night. Then he said the woman witnessed Bigfoot raping the horse and using the horse's tail as leverage. This caused the horse's tail hair to get all tangled in a braid-like pattern. When I told my conspiracy theorist friend about this, he mentioned that his grandpa told his mom that the tribe believed that Bigfoot would sometimes kidnap women. In the Poet tribe in California, Bigfoot kidnapped a woman, raped her. The women escaped but eventually had a hybrid baby. The boy looked mostly normal but was hairier. He grew up to have more strength, better smell, and better sight than normal people. In recent years, there was an article written about Bigfoot attempting to rape a male Colorado hunter while he hunted in the forest. There is a 2006 Bigfoot documentary that took place near the Glacier National Park, where someone found a small Bigfoot leg that had weird webbed feet. I think the documentary is called Bigfoot Lives and might be on Netflix. Now on to my second story. Going back to 2000, my dad just bought a cabin from an old guy who used to work for the railroads. It was a small yellow cabin and a small bunkhouse three feet in front of the cabin. Five hundred feet west from the cabin there was a train car. You couldn't see it unless you walked behind some pine trees. It was a small yellow cabin. About two hundred feet from the cabin was the highway, out in the middle of nowhere. A small yellow cabin ten feet away from the house, a street light in front of the driveway. Behind the house were some train tracks, and about three miles behind the house were some mountains. When my dad got the cabin, I was only twelve at the time, and my brother was nine or ten. First time going into the cabin, I can see a pellet gun just sitting there in the corner. I take it outside and start shooting it around. I walk down to the bushes where there was a pond nearby. On the other side, that was only one hundred feet right from the cabin. As a I look around, I see some ducks swimming by. I point the pellet gun ready to shoot until I heard my dad say, Don't be shooting them ducks now. Would you like it if I shot you? My dad replied. When my dad went inside the cabin and was out of hearing range, I grabbed my pellet gun and took the shot and killed the duck. As I watch it floating there in the water, guess I just wanted to see what it was like to shoot something for the first time. I remember having this really scary dream at the cabin. I was walking out to the living room and I look out the window and saw a dead carcass deer creature looking back at me with white dead lifeless eyes, making a screeching sound at me as it ran away into the woods. That dream always psychologically disturbed me every time I thought about it. My dad would just tell me I must have seen something on TV before. He never would believe in stuff like that. Going on to August of 2013, me and my cousin Dan and his dad Dan Jr. went for a little hike towards the mountain hillside in the Lewis and Clark National Forest. It was just south of the Glacier National Park nearby where the cabin was. As Dan, his dad, and me go for our hike, this time I'm carrying my grandpa's old gun, a 12-inch single-shot 10-gauge I inherited from after he passed away eight years ago. As we going deeper into the woods, we stumble across an old run-down trailer house and some kind of barn shed on the side of the trailer used for putting horses into. When I stepped into the barn shed part, I was startled by big yellow eyes staring at me. It was an owl. My cousin's dad told me that should kill it, 
that it would only bring me bad luck if I didn't, so pointed my ten-gauge at it, pulled the hammer, then took the shot. As I watched the bird hit the ground, I walked away. Now I wanted to go check out what was all in the trailer. Walking around the living room of the old run-down trailer home, I hear a thud and turn to look what's behind me. Standing on a table staring right at me with big yellow eyes was a another owl. Like before, I took my grandpa's ten-gauge, pointed it at the bird, then fired a shot. After leaving the place and getting up a little ways, I was looking around using my binoculars. I could see my dad's cabin five or six miles north from our location. I tell my cousin there's my dad's cabin, and we should check it out later, he agreed. Later that day, my cousin and me pick up a few girls and decide to make our way up to the cabin. We broke into my dad's cabin, and first thing we noticed is there was no electricity. We hadn't lived in it for a while, and my dad didn't pay on the bill for a long time. We were sitting around the living room in the cabin and found some old chopped wood. While making a fire, we start to tell jokes and got really drunk. After a while, Dan and me get really blacked out and start to fist fighting. After that happened, Dan and the two girls headed out. I'm left at the cabin alone. I start to get tired and decide to head for bed. It was a king-sized bed with a bed frame made out of logs. While sleeping, I felt like I couldn't move. I thought I kept hearing some voice but couldn't make out what it was saying at first. When I turned my head just a bit, I saw at the foot of the bed a human carcass-like entity. It had bleeding eyes staring angrily at me, really pissed off at me about something. It kept repeating the words, The devil is here, the devil is here. When it would talk, its mouth wouldn't move at all, but words would come out even though it wasn't moving at mouth you. It sort of looked like a ghoul from Fallout 3. After a while, I came out of it and left the next morning. The next week, me and my cousin Dan get over the fight we had that day and decide to make up. Dan's dad, my cousin Dan, and me decided to go for a hike to the same place. After hiking for a while, we stop by a creek and pass a joint around. After smoking, Dan and his dad decide to take a little walk. I waited down by the creek as they took their time walking through the woods and happened to just doze off while waiting for Dan and his dad to get back. As I lay there on the rocks, I heard a chilling voice calling my name. I heard it coming from the forest when I woke from my short little nap. I realized Dan and his dad weren't back yet, so I get up and walk around to loosen up a bit as I was thinking about the voice calling my name. I remember it sounding really strange and disorientating in a way, like a hollow echo kind of sound to it. What if nature was pissed off and the wilderness was trying to send me some kind of message? A year after, it was September of 2014 and was probably around 2 p.m., that day I was in my new blue 1992 XLT F-150 with my Remington 7,645, 70 lever action hanging on the gun racks behind my head while I am driving down the road on Highway 2, coming up from the mountain pass. After arriving at my dad's cabin, I realize I haven't been there in a year since when me and Dan drank there. I decide to stop at the cabin on the way through. After getting out of the truck and walking to the cabin, I looked into the window and could see someone inside. He had light brown hair, was wearing glasses, and looked to be about five or ten. When I looked inside, he was sitting on the couch changing his socks. His face looked very startled when he saw me through the window. I ran into the cabin and smashed him in the face and broke his glasses. Then I knocked him to the floor. He looked up at me with his hand covering his nose, trying to stop the bleeding. I told him, Hey! What the fuck you think you're doing here? Get the fuck out. My dad owns this place. Get the fuck out of here, man. The guy was really ashamed. He apologized for his intrusion and got up and left. After I told my dad that a man broke into his cabin, he told me to check for anything missing or if anything looks out of place. I let my dad know nothing was missing, but the back door was broken down and there was a nail stuck through the latch on the side of the window. This is so the window couldn't shut all the way. It had to be from the guy who broke into the cabin so he could get back into the cabin a lot easier, I guess. My dad decides that maybe it would be a good idea if I stayed at the cabin and said that he would get the electricity back on if I did. Remembering seeing what I did that day last year, I thought maybe it wouldn't be as bad staying there this time with some light in the place and maybe some company. My dad and me fixed the place up a little. We boarded up the back door and tried to shut the side window. It was nailed down pretty good. 
Only a month later in October of 2014, we got the place fixed up decent enough. It's 8 p.m., and I go out to the cabin to check if the lights are still on. When entering the cabin, there is a small shed in the front about the size of an elevator. There are Karazny lamps, handsaw, and some snowshoes on the wall. As you enter the cabin to the left is the ceiling fan, coach, and a cowboy boot and pistol belt lampshade. When you look to the right, there is closet and wooden gun rack. On the gun rack was my grandpa's old single-shot 10-gauge. When me and my dad fixed the place up a bit and I remember putting it there. Going furthermore to the right, inside of the cabin was a cornered brick wall and a round brick platform where the wood stove is placed on. Just right above the wood stove, hanging on the brick part of the walls, was an old bull skull. On the wall hung a painting portrait of a scrubby, drunken, dirty old cowboy with a dirty old dark blue button shirt and red rag around his neck. A dirty old cowboy that had really bad teeth and seemed to be missing a tooth as he is smiling in the painting. He had black hair, a thick black mustache, thick black eyebrows, and also had a five o'clock shadow. My dad liked to have a cowboy style to his cabin. Furthermore, to the left would be where the main living room window. It has big red curtains in front of it. Just above in the living room is a ceiling fan and a long dark wooden beam that runs right above between the kitchen and living room ceiling. A bit of it connects to the brick wall part of it right there in the living room. On the entertainment center sat a TV leaning against the wall. A little to the right was a coffee table that had the cowboy boot and pistol belt lamp. There was the kitchen further in the back with the back door. It got broken into. Also some stairs that just go down to the basement of the cabin. Just around the brick park of the wall is a small hallway that leads to two bedrooms and a bathroom. Everything in the cabin looked good. So far, the lights were running again, and I could hear the radio playing on the kitchen counter as I was thinking about on staying for the night. I thought I could use some company, so I decided to run to town. As I was leaving, getting into my truck and was pulling out of the driveway of the cabin, I saw at the corner of my eye something fly by. It landed somewhere on the ground in the dark. I didn't get a good look at it, but I thought I'd seen that it had a really long wingspan, more than just for an ordinary bird. As I was going to pick up my brother and our two friends who we grew up with our whole lives, Ed and Cole, who were also brothers. Ed was the oldest. He was around 6'2 in height and always wore a green alien cap. Short, dark hair, had a beard like me, and always liked talking about conspiracy theories like UFOs and the paranormal. Cole had really long hair, wore black cannibal corpse t-shirts. All four of us liked metal music and would all talk about going to a music concert someday. My younger brother Anthony was also a big admirer of music. He wasn't into as hardcore of bands as Cole was, but he did like some pretty good metal bands, though, like Pantera and Audioslave. Anthony would have really bad seizures at the time, so I always made sure to keep a really close eye on my brother. We were all sitting around inside the cabin, passing a blunt, listening to the radio. It picked up a station from the reservation of two native guys telling scary stories of skinwalkers and of Goatman. Probably just for the Halloween weekend, I guess, since it was October that year. After a while, I stood up to go take a look out the window. As I was peeking through the big red curtains of the living room window, I saw something very strange. About 150 feet from the road in front of the cabin, and about 30 feet behind my truck standing on the ground, I saw a bird-like creature. But not any kind of bird I ever saw. Something didn't look right about it. It had a head and a neck almost like a human, and something weird above its head. It looked to be like some kind of horns as far as what I saw. I couldn't make out what the face looked like. As the bird thing stood there just staring back at the cabin, I tried to tell the other guys what I saw outside. I tried showing them, but about the time we looked out the window, it was gone. Soon after a bit, we all start to get pretty tired. Ed and Cole head for the back bedroom with two extra beds while my brother went into the back bedroom, the one with the big log bed frame. I slept in the living room. In the living room, I noticed there were two wooden owl statues that my dad must have picked up at a thrift store and put there when we were fixing up the place. Both of them were standing on the top shelf, just on the far sides from each other, just right above the, the TV I made a fire from the wood stove. When I was sitting on the couch, I looked up at one of the owls. 
Thoughts were going through my mind as the creepy owl statue staring back at me lit by the light of the fire from the wood stove lighting up the living room. I couldn't help but feeling kind of guilty as I thought back to that day I killed them owls last year and start getting creepy vibes, so I turned on the lamp by the window. I then decided to crash out on the couch. After a while I was awakened and started to hear something just out of the, the half-opened window. The one I said that wouldn't shut all the way that was just behind the coffee table and lamp I just turned on. The sound outside got closer and closer to the window. I started to feel like I couldn't move. It was all happening again just like last time. I could only move my eyes and I can only hear what was around me. I heard something that sounded really weird. It was right outside the window by the coffee table and lampshade. It sounded like a growl with a muffled sound. I looked at window that was only half open. There the thing was bursting, its head through the window, flapping and screeching around. Finally revealing itself was a creature that had no face and had mix of between feathers and fur with log pointy horns, sort of like antelope. The creature was trying to get in through the window. Its head was convulsing and swinging, flapping around fast and unnaturally. I finally snapped out of the sleep paralysis nightmare. I jumped up from the couch and rushed to the gun rack to my grandpa's single-shot 10-gauge shotgun. I spun around fast as I could and shot the window out where I saw the creature try to enter through. But after I came to my senses, I realized the creature was gone. Soon after that, my brother Ed and Cole came rushing out looking surprised and concerned on what they just heard. The blast was very loud. My brother shouts out, What the fuck are you doing? Dad's going to be really pissed you shot out the window. He replied after that as we all stood around confused, trying to make sense of what just happened. I told everyone what I saw. We looked out the window but didn't see anything. Ed, with his conspiracy ideas, thought probably the entity could have used some kind of telepathic telepathy to invade my dreams because maybe it wanted to reveal itself to terrorize me. It seemed to have looked like it had the features and traits of all the animals I killed combined in one, coming back as a nightmare to get revenge on being such an animal killer. Cole heard the same growling, mumbling sounds that I heard. Meanwhile, there was no other damage to the cabin besides what we cleaned up, pieces of broken glass laying around. We then cut some cardboard out and placed it on the side window and the lampshade was pretty shredded up. After that, we all tried going back to bed. Later, I got up, go to the kitchen. All of the sudden, I saw a black figure go into the bedroom where Anthony was sleeping. I went to check on my brother to see if he was okay. When I opened the door, there he was on the bed. He was bleeding from the mouth, going into a seizure. I rushed in fast over to him and pulled out my wallet, trying to get it into his mouth to keep him from biting his tongue. I called for Ed and Cole for help and said, That's it. We're taking him to the hospital. It was probably 3 a.m. that night we carried him out to the truck jumped in the truck. As I drove out of driveway and got up the road, we all headed for town. I'll never forget that night, because around that time two of my closest relatives to me passed away in 2016. It was ironic that I killed two owls and around that same year those two people died. So next time when you ever go into the woods and you see a messenger like an owl, down be disrespectful and kill it, or you might get haunted by some kind of creature trying to get revenge. After that, I started picking up my pace trying to get into our hounds. But it was too late. Just minutes later, the pack of coyotes had made it to our hounds, and within seconds, a massive fight broke out. I heard them grab a hold of Bo, and then he started whimpering and took off running to get away from them. But not old Jake. He held his ground right next to the tree he had tracked the raccoon to. I believe he did it because in his mind, he might have thought the coyote was coming to take the tree away from him but really they just wanted to eat him. Old Jake fought all over the place with the pack coyote he was putting an absolute whipping on them for a while. But soon after that the whole dynamic of the fight that had broken out changed and the coyotes were starting to fight Old Jake as a pack. My papa called me again. Get in there quick, they are going to kill him. So I started running through the forest, scared for my dog's life. Suddenly again the fight changed and Bo had circled back around and came back to help Old Jake fight the pack of coyotes, and once again Old Jake was holding his ground. Oregon, so I thought. The coyotes were whimpering and screaming, and it was just an awful ruckus in the woods, an absolute battle. I soon made it to Old Jake, and once I shined my flashlight on him, 
He had a coyote by the throat, then let it go once he saw me. It then took off running along with the rest of the pack. I walked over to old Jake bent over, patted him on the head and checked him out, showing a few cuts and gashes on him, but overall was in good shape, being that he was just in a fight with a pack of coyotes and lived. Just in front of us was a huge black oak tree, and behind it I heard the sound of a coyote whimpering and doing what I would call a blood gargle, choking on its own blood. Old Jake and I walked around to check it out, thinking that around this tree we would see that Bo had killed a coyote. But once we could see, I then noticed that it wasn't Bo, it wasn't Bo at all. It was a great big dog, really broad, bigger than the size of a St. Bernard. It then turns and looks at me while holding a dead coyote in its mouth by its rib cage, and no part of the dead coyote was touching the ground. This dog was holding this 50-plus LB, coyote off of the ground. I stopped and just looked as if we were just standing feet apart from each other. The strange dog dropped the coyote out of his mouth and looked at me. That's when I realized how much I underestimated the massive size of this animal. It leaned in forward, then stood up on its hind legs. In a really slow motion that I can only describe as if you've ever seen an elderly person try to get up out of a rocking chair. At this moment I thought it was leaning against something and that was the only logical explanation. This thing then takes two steps forward while standing on two legs. That's when I noticed its chest, because it didn't have a dog's chest, it had the chest of a man, an abdomen. Then its hands caught my attention because it was moving them up beside itself, and it had hands more similar to that of a man but more like claws. I saw its face was charcoal-colored with solid black eyes of eternal darkness. It had blood coating it dripping down from its mouth to its chest like hot candle wax running down a wick. So much blood not like the blood you would normally see in any type of animal fight. It was more so like it was eating the coyote alive during the previous attack before I arrived. Again it takes another step towards me, and I break out into a cold sweat, my mind finally realizing what I was looking at is a damn werewolf that is not supposed to be of this world. The feeling in my mind was just absolute horror, as if the world around me no longer existed, and I was in some sort of overwhelming sense of dread. Just in a millisecond my fight-or-flight emotion kicked in, and I jumped back and started to run. I am shining my flashlight forward as I run and then back behind me over and over to see what is happening as I run. During this time the sounds of my oversized gumboots were just clicking loudly in the stillness of the night, and the crunching of the dead leaves beneath each stride that I took. The creature then begins to chase after me, moving at a pace I have never seen, but soon after the monster took only a few steps, old Jake hit into him, lunging his body weight towards the dogman-type creature that made a loud thud noise of old Jake's body weight slamming into the monster, snapping his jaws together and growling trying to protect me from any harm. As I shined my light behind me, the werewolf just pushed old Jake off of him with one hand like he was just a gnat, fly, or a flea, just like he was nothing and it didn't bother the creature at all while old Jake rolled back on the ground four or five feet. Then the creature continued to chase me like I was the only thing in the world it was interested in. I started to yell out, Put it to him, Jake. Put it to him. Come on, you can do it. As I continued to run for my life with my gun still strapped to my back, it was only a twenty-two caliber rifle that would cause no harm to this creature other than maybe just pissing it off even worse. I stood at five feet ten inches, and this creature towered over me at least two more feet in height. As I am running finally once again, old Jake attempts to stop him as he chases me, throwing his own body weight into the monster, and like the first time it pushes him aside with ease. And back to the chase, the werewolf went right back in my direction as I ran. It had its mind set on me, and me alone. I am running with everything I can run with all the energy my legs can produce through the forest towards the direction of the truck and once again I started to scream, Come on, old Jake, put it to him, get him. Jake, get him. Come on, Jake, I need you. As this thing was gaining ground on me quickly. And for the third time, old Jake comes in towards the monster and hits him again with his body weight. And once he did, I heard a loud popping noise, and I heard what I call the jaws of death locked down on the creature. Before I turned around, I just knew that old Jake had finally made good contact with the monster and that when I seen Jake had his mouth latched onto the hip of the werewolf just hanging there on it like a chihuahua on a mailman. 
That was the size difference because old Jake was just nowhere near the same size as this animal. The monster then stopped and grabbed old Jake with both of its hands, and as sure as I am telling you this story now, it threw old Jake through the woods like a baseball. I could see old Jake's body flying through the air, hitting low-hanging tree branches and leaves and stuff. I knew at that point old Jake was dead. It was just me and the monster in this moment. And I continued to run with tears rolling down my face and a sense of pain and dread with the thoughts in my mind that this thing just killed my dog. I am all alone. No one here to save me. Not even Daniel Boone can come up from the grave and save me at this point. I am a goner for sure. The monster then continued to run on after me. At this point, it's so close to me I can feel the heat on the back of my neck. I'm trying to run in a zigzag type of movement. While being overwhelmed with emotion, I started yelling once again, Come on, old Jake, please, I need you. Put it to him, Jake, put it to him. But no matter how many times I yelled and screamed for help, old Jake didn't come. He was gone. I stumbled over a fallen tree branch or something and fell face down on my belly into an old treetop that had blown over in the forest, maybe after a storm or something. I am not sure why it was there. I rolled over on my back and the creature dropped down on all four feet and I started to crawl backwards into the mangled tree branches and decaying leaves while the monster continued to pursue me. At this point the animal and I were at point-blank range, just a couple of feet from each other. It was snapping its mouth and snarling the blood from the freshly killed coyote still dripping down its mouth mixed in with snot and drool, while it blew its breath right on me with the smell of rot and decay coming with it. Meanwhile, the whole time I am continuing to yell, Come on, Jake, come on! I knew at that time this was it, this was the end, and I was trying to crawl for my life backwards while facing the animal just trying to find a way out. And as the creature was now in range to grab a hold of me, suddenly out of nowhere, Old Jake hits the monster broadside, throwing his body weight into the creature, and it rolls over on its back. Jake climbs up on top of it and just starts mauling him, snapping his jaws, just munching on this monster. Old Jake was really putting the hurt to this dog from hell. I heard Jake's jaws lock down someplace on the creature, and the sound of bones crushing. The monster let out a painful howl that felt like it rattled the very earth I was crawling on. That's when I realized this is my chance and I stood up and ran across the mountain once again. I could hear the whole time the battle that was taking place behind me, and I was no longer looking back. But unfortunately the fight changed, and I could hear the monster finally turn the tide of the fight back on old Jake, and it sounded like it was just ripping Jake to pieces. He was letting out painful barks and whimpers. It was making my stomach turn into knots, hearing the pain old Jake was going through. At this time I came upon a clearing not far from the truck and I turned around, took the rifle off of my back and began to fire it into the air. P.O.W. Pow W. Pow W. Pow W. Pow W. The gunshots echoed off the mountains around me. I started yelling, come on Jake, come on, please come on, let's go. But then the forest and woods went completely silent and it seemed no noises at all could be heard. So I ran down to the truck, opened up the door and climbed inside. My grandfather said, what on earth is going on? And I said, just drive, we have to go, we have to get out of here. Then started telling him what happened every detail I could as I was trembling in pure terror. Calmly, my papa said, listen, if you want to hunt, fish, and do stuff as a man, then you need to realize that there are things in the woods that I cannot explain, and you have to come to terms with that if you want to continue to live this lifestyle. And in his humbling words of wisdom, he said, since you are so upset, I will go ahead and take you home, but we will come back in the morning to look for Bo and old Jake. I said, no point in coming back. I heard what happened. Old Jake is dead, Papa. He is gone. He fought for my life, but he just didn't make it. Once again, my grandfather spoke wisdom, saying, if everything you said is true, then you owe it to old Jake to at least come back in the morning and look for him. He fought tooth and nail for your life. And as a boy of just fifteen years old, what my papa said was both the law and the truth to me. Every single word was one of wisdom and knowledge well beyond my years. We drove home, and I didn't sleep very much at all the rest of the night, knowing as soon as day broke we were going to drive back out to that area to look for our hounds. Meanwhile, still being filled with mixed emotions of the event that had happened just hours before, feeling everything from fear to heartbreak an absolutely traumatic event. 
But as the morning came and the fog was lifting from the mountains, we loaded up in the truck and traveled back out to the location we had been hunting the night before. My papa got out of the truck and I just rolled my window down and we both began to call for our dogs. Here, Jake, here, let go home. We also yelled for Bo, but he had run far away when the coyotes had bitten him. So at that time I wasn't that worried about him. We would drive up and down the gravel road repeating the same actions time and time again with no luck. So my grandfather said we would go home and return that evening to try once more. And that evening when we drove back to where we last saw our hounds, we started to call and whistle for them again. On down the road a little bit we could hear something moving through the forest coming out towards the road, and once it stepped out my grandfather said, Hey, Bo, just came out of the woods that big red-ticked dog of yours, so grab your dog leash and go get him. I said, All right, Papa, started to walk towards Bo that was just barely moving slowly, and as I got closer to him I realized it wasn't Bo, it was old Jake, covered from head to toenail in blood matted and coated in it. He is torn all to pieces, but he is alive. His ear looks like freshly cooked ramen noodles just shredded hanging beside his head. He had a large open wound in his chest. His nose was sitting almost sideways on his head with a missing tail that had been torn off. Massive claw marks along the side of both of his hind quarters. On top of all that he was walking with a severe limp because his right hip was fractured. But he was alive. My grandfather walked over to him and grabbed all 120 pounds. Of old Jake's mangled body, picked him up and carried him over to the vehicle and put him in the back of the truck. I had never seen my papa do something like that, because he was a tough love type of a guy. But he was just as heartbroken at that moment as I was. Then we drove out of Daniel Boone National Forest and back to the farm. Most people, I believe, would have probably, with a dog that was so severely injured, put him out of his misery and buried him. But we didn't. My mama did a lot of veterinarian work with our animals on our farm. And somehow, against all odds, she was able to doctor old Jake up and pretty much bring him back to life. From that moment on, old Jake and I had a special bond. We were always best friends, and he lived a long and happy life. I will never forget what old Jake did for me that night in the Battle of the Backwoods. And if a dog loves its human enough, they will battle something that is unbeatable to keep you safe from harm. I gave up on old Jake's life multiple times that terrible night, and he fought for me over and over again. That was a really hard thing to live with on top of the trauma I was not ready for at that time in my life, and if it weren't for the wisdom of my humble grandfather, then we would have lost old Jake forever. Both of them have now left this world and been called way up yonder to hopefully hunt in the hills of heaven. You can say what you want to say about what terrifies you the most, but to me it will always be the thing I saw. I guess you can say it was a dogman, werewolf, hellhound, skinwalker. I am not really sure, but what I do know is it bled and felt pain just like any other animal in the world and so I know what I saw was tangible and real. By the way, about a week later someone found Bo at a local country store and I was able to also get him back as well. I am Hamish pronounced as Hemish, and I live in the Netherlands. And what I want to share was really the most horrifying experience I ever had in my entire life. Me and my family went on a vacation in Sweden. It was the most beautiful vacation ever, because Sweden is a land with untamed woodland and the lakes crystal clear, and me being a guy who loves the woods, it was like a dream come true. The first two days were uneventful. We were just having fun in the woods and the lake, because we were taking the canoe and scanned the area off every island in the lake. But that one day I was rowing the canoe and I was with my two sisters, the one always loved to fool around in every kind off situation you could imagine. Let's call her Anne for privacy reasons, and the other one let's call her Julia. For privacy reasons was so serious, and I find it so annoying that I asked my sister Anne to drop me of the shore, cause I didn't I was irritated, and my butt was starting to hurt after sitting an hour on a wooden plank so I got dropped of. And it wasn't that far from the camp we stayed, but the woods were really dense, and there were many boulders and steep rocky hills, so it took me a while to get back and I enjoyed it. Some minutes later I decided to take a little break on a little rock formation, but I felt watched and I took in my surroundings. I'm a very alert guy, so I can kind of sense when something bad is going to happen, but as I watched my surroundings I saw this little tree, sturdy and small, so I took my little Leatherman knife out and made a spear from it for whatever animal that was out there. Because there are moose in Sweden, 
and you really don't want to piss off a moose, but back to the story. So with my spear, I walked back to the camp, only to came across a little stream of water, but it was big enough for me to not jump over it to cross it. So I looked around and I found a fallen pine tree. So I walked over there and put one foot on the log, and I hear heavy footsteps behind me, four thumps. I looked around and nothing to be seen, but I was scared. So I waited for my nerves to calm down, and then I put my other foot on the log and wanted to cross the stream as fast as possible when I hear Anne behind me say, Hemish, wait up. So I look behind me and see nothing, and I thought I was imagining things. So I turned and wanted to go when I hear her again, Hemish, wait up. And then, of the most putrid smell, Al hit me right in the face. It smelled like fifty pounds of rotting flesh in a hot summer sun of forty degrees Celsius. And I looked around for where that smell came from, and there it was, fifty meters behind a tree, a moose, and I know they're big, so I just took it for a moose, but then it was getting on his hind legs, and it was like seven to eight feet tall, and looked at me with the most humanoid eyes there was. It was almost giving a vibrating light, and it had bony arms, what I took for legs, and it had a moose-like head, and it said again, but with a more animalistic noise, Hemish weighed up. And I froze, because I knew of wendigos and skinwalkers, but I thought they only lived in the U.S.A., but I was almost positive that this monster was indeed a skinwalker, and the I remembered that my sister Anne was still in that canoe because I could hear her laughing in the close by. I looked at it, and it looked back at me and took a few steps towards me, and I knew I was done for. So I wanted to scream for help because I knew no way in hell I can defeat this on my own. So I was about to scream when it made the most bizarre gesture. It put its bony finger to its disfigured lips and shushed me, telling me to be silent, and so I did cause otherwise I knew I was done for. So it took five more huge steps towards me, and the smell was so strong I was vomiting. But then I heard Anne laugh again much closer, and it looked up and ran back into the woods with the most inhuman speed I've ever seen, and I ran to the camp as fast as I could, and I locked myself up in my room for the rest of the vacation till we were going back to the Netherlands, and when we drove away on Saturday morning at 5 a.m., I swear I saw those eyes looking at me, and I looked away glad to leave that thing behind, and I never saw it again. And I hope to not meet it again, that was my story, and I hope that anyone who reads this or hears it knows if you're in a woods that you were never been before and you are alone, be alert and stay on your guard, because it might just save your life. As I'm writing this, the events of this story happened yesterday. I am a freshman in high school, and my school year is almost over. Towards the end of every school year, I'll have a night, usually on a Saturday, when I invite a friend or two over to stay at my house. On the Saturday in question, I invited one of them. We'll call him G.G., and I have been close friends ever since fifth grade, and we both enjoy things we would consider creepy. I live in a nice neighborhood that is pretty wealthy, which makes it have a nice look at nighttime. The past few times I've invited him over, we have walked around my neighborhood at nighttime, and had deep conversations about personal things going on in our lives. This night was no different. We started our walk at around 1.30 and visited our usual stops to walk around the neighborhood. After about an hour, I came up with the idea to visit the old house I used to live in. My old house isn't too far from my old one, but it would take some time since we were walking. My old house was down a rocky lane about a mile long and resided in the woods. G was down for the idea, so we started going there. It took us about an hour. The lane usually has corn stalks on both sides, but farmers weren't growing crops during this time. So there was just a field of small cut corn stalks on our left and right. When my feet started walking on the rocky lane, a wave of nostalgia hit me, a flood of old memories from this property. But I pushed my nostalgia to the back of my mind and continued talking to G about the relevant topic. We walked for about ten minutes, and then we were finally at the tree line. I don't mean to make the story sound all cliché and dramatic here, but the entrance to the woods looked more eerie than I remembered. Something about it just gave me the chills. Deep down, I didn't want to walk further, but we were about where we wanted to be. I told myself that we would keep going for a little longer, and then we would turn back and start heading home. As we got closer to the tree line, I started to hear footsteps. I chalked it up to be a deer or a typical forest animal. That's when we heard it. A blood-curdling scream from a woman erupted from the forest, turning the quiet night into something of nightmares. The scream lasted for about three seconds, 
and without stopping, the scream turned into the growl of some animal I'd never heard before. Now I know what you may be thinking to yourself right now. It must have just been a coyote. I can see where someone would assume that, but you'd have to be there to know what I mean. I even listened to videos of coyote howls and growls later that night to see if this was the case. After watching them, I can confirm there was no coyote, and it wasn't a person either. We hauled ass to the end of the drive. While we were running, I looked back for only half a second, and I could have sworn I saw something standing on two legs watching us run away. I was skinny and tall. The thing had to have been at least six foot three. Once we got to the end of the driveway and I was confident nothing was following us, we took a moment to catch our breath. We were both keeping a calm composure, but we were both terrified on the inside. After a quick breather, we started to speed walk back to my house. After about a minute or two of walking, I looked behind us and saw something walking on four legs at the end of the driveway. It wasn't walking like a coyote would. It was walking like a human would if it was on four legs. Its kneecaps were up at the top of its head, and the figure was incredibly skinny. I told G this, and we started walking even faster. My brother is a night owl, so after five more seconds of walking, I pulled out my phone and told him to pick us up as soon as possible. He got to where we were fairly quickly, and we drove back home. G and I were speechless. We had no idea what to think or say. Eventually, we started discussing what that thing could have been. I'm not sure why this idea popped into my head, but I first thought of Skinwalker. We looked at the noises of animals that lived near that area to see if it could have been something as harmless as that. But none of the animals we looked at would be capable of producing the sound we had heard in those woods. We fell asleep around 5 a.m., and I woke up just two hours later. I couldn't fall back asleep. All I could think about was what happened just a few hours ago. G woke up at around 11 o'clock, and he stayed at my house until he had to leave at 4 o'clock. Once he left, I went to my brother's room to discuss with him what had happened. As it turns out, my old house resides on Native American territory. It then occurred to me that what we likely encountered was a skinwalker. My brother also told me that he thought he heard a woman's voice in the corner of his room that night that said, You saved them. Everything mentioned here happened last night, and I'm still scared shitless. We all agreed not to tell anyone that wasn't close what happened. Stop walking at night and never return there again. And that's an agreement we will stay true to forever. My story begins in Colorado. I was 14 years old at the time. My family was taking a trip to visit my grandmother, who lives deep in the country. We were planning to stay over a few nights and enjoy the peace and quiet of the country. I've always been more of an indoorsy person, but I did love taking a nice hike through the woods from time to time. The highway drive was long and uneventful, but once we finally got there, I was super excited. After all, I had my own room in the beautiful cabin my grandmother lived in, with an amazing view of the lake and forest surrounding the property. I exchanged greetings with her, and after a few minutes of idle conversation, headed to my room. I pulled out my laptop and began to get set up for a quality gaming session when I first heard the howling. It sounded like a wolf's cry, but slower almost distorted, like if you recorded the howl, played it back at half the speed, and lowered the pitch. It was creepy, but having little to no experience living in the country, I brushed it off, mentally categorizing it as a different animal. Soon, the sun began to set, and I was indeed tired, partly to the long car ride. I began to get settled into bed, and despite the thick comforter, something didn't feel right. It's a feeling hard to describe like something was misplaced or missing. I didn't know what it was, but I brushed it off, telling myself it was just weird to sleep in an unfamiliar place, and eventually I drifted off. I woke up around ten in the morning feeling well-rested. Looking through my window, I could see it had gotten foggy, as there were billowing clouds of mist drifting through the trees. It was raining, too, and heavily, as it was hard to see through the windows due to the excessive amount of water droplets. I threw on some pajamas and went to grab some breakfast. When I walked in, there was a note on the kitchen table. According to it, my family left the house to grab some medication for my grandma, and they'd be back in a couple hours. Eating my frosted flakes, I was sitting on the comfortable couch directly under the living room window, watching the rain and fog. Then I heard that eerie howl. Again, it was slow and thick, 
almost sounding deliberate. As that happened, I just noticed a figure creep forward in the fog. Of course, foggy weather in the country can be extremely thick, and I couldn't see anything over five feet from the window. I could barely make it out, but it looked like a wolf. Almost. The feeling that something was wrong, very, very wrong with the animal hit me. Then, the realization. The creature was standing on its back legs. Its back legs. I was shocked, confused. When I finally could think clearly, I looked at the creature in more detail. Its legs were twisted, bent in weird ways, almost like it was hit by a car. Of course, up here by the cabin, the closest road that's often used is a good mile away. As I looked on in horror, the creature spun around and on its two hind legs sprinted, straight up sprinted, disappearing instantly into the thick fog clouds. As it turned around, though, I could see it had no tail, literally no tail, like it was ripped off. I instantly ran back to my room, shut and locked the door, and hopped on my laptop, trying to forget the horrific sight I just saw. When my family finally got back, around three, I waited till my parents were out of the room to tell my grandma. My parents wouldn't believe me anyways. I knew she was Native American, but not that she was Navajo. She told me that what she believed I saw was a skinwalker. Supposedly, it's a shape-shifting spirit or witch that takes the form of animals in order to harm people. However, it can never perfectly replicate the animal it takes the form of. When we left three days later, I was happy to get out of those woods. After researching the legend of the skinwalker further, I honestly believe that that is what I saw. So to all those listening, be careful when you go deep into the countryside of Colorado. If I met that creature when I was outside the cabin, I may not have been here to tell this story. Nothing haunts a man more than the decisions of the past. The world threw something impossible for me to comprehend at an early age. I would soon find out life is not all rainbows and cotton candy. Many people come here and see the majestic mist rising from the mountains early in the morning and think of it as pure beauty. But all I see is gases the hills belch up from whatever they swallowed up the night before. Because for me the mountains have tainted my very soul and left holes in my heart forever. The wilderness can grant many gifts, growth, new life, clarity, and a vast amount of opportunities. But also the wild can suffocate you in sorrow and drown you in dread given the right circumstances. Have you ever asked yourself what you would do in the event of needing a helping hand in a dire situation? This was the difficulty that I was faced with which changed my life forever. I grew up in the foothills of eastern Kentucky, what I consider to be the base of the Appalachian Mountains, on my grandparents' farm mostly. I spent the majority of my childhood learning lessons of life with my grandfather. The value of a dollar was also how I had my fun digging ginseng roots, hunting for substance, and wildlife population management in our area. My grandfather was a fur bearer like his father before him. Anything that was hard work pretty much is part of my upbringing. Looking back on those years, I would not trade them for anything. We went to church every Wednesday and Sunday, always had a lot of cousins around to play within the creeks and streams around the farm. Taught early survival in the wilderness, the lessons I learned never came easy, but always held lasting impressions. We only went to town a couple of days a week when we visited the feed store for our livestock, and sometimes I would rent a movie from the video store uptown. That was as close as I got to the big city lifestyle as a child. The main thing we did most nights when the whippoorwill started singing and the lightning bugs came out was to gather our hound dogs and travel to the Daniel Boone National Forest to go raccoon hunting. We did this because, as I said, my grandfather and I were fur bearers. The raccoon population in our area is very thick, so this was part of our lifestyle to chase that hard-earned dollar. Also for wildlife management population control, because raccoons can carry and transmit more types of diseases than most animals in our area. We had two dogs at that time. Our young dog's name was Bo. He was a red tick hound in the breed of the animal, beautiful in every way. He was mostly red in color with a few white specks on him, almost the color of strawberry wine. Our older dog was a treeing walker hound. Around here we just call his breed Walker, and his name was Old Jake. He was a giant of a dog for his breed at somewhere around 120 pounds. He was a tricolored dog, meaning he was black, white, and tan. He was an absolutely great hound and had a heck of a good nose on him for tracking critters through the mountains of the Daniel Boone National Forest. 
Old Jake wasn't afraid of anything at all once he would track a raccoon to a tree. It was his domain. On this particular night, it was the opening night of raccoon hunting season in the state of Kentucky, October 1, 2003. My grandfather and I had decided to go on a hunting adventure into the Daniel Boone National Forest. He was in poor health, so I always had to handle our dogs and take care of them when we went out on our nightly hunts. We had gotten a bit of a late start that evening, so we had to travel off of the beaten path on a six-mile road called Shooting Range Road near the Clear Creek and Leatherwood area of the Daniel Boone. Once we got to the very end of the road and it came to a dead end, we parked our truck, then got out of the vehicle, dropped the tailgate down, and opened up the dog box door after that. Bo and old Jake jumped to the ground, ran straight down a creek in the forest, and started hunting for a raccoon scent. A short while after old Jake started barking on the scent track he smelled, and then Bo joined in with him, making that sweet southern hound music that whistled a gravely song through the crisp night air. They tracked the scent of the raccoon they were chasing up the side of a mountain and over a cliff a good seven hundred yards away from the truck. Shortly thereafter, the raccoon got tired of running and decided to climb a tree. Both the dogs let out what is called a location bark, letting us know that they found the animal location they had been chasing, and will continue to bark until I get to the tree in which they are at, because this is how they were trained. My grandfather looked at me and said, Sounds to me like they found it. Go on, grab the gun out of the truck and take the two-way radio with you so we can keep in touch. Because, as I said, my grandfather was in poor health and could not travel on foot very far distances. And I did just as he said, strapped the gun to my back, grabbed the two-way radio, and started walking into the forest towards the location of our dogs. As I made my way in, I heard the sound of a pack of coyotes off in the distance start barking and howling going on crazy as a coyote pack does. Grandfather called me on the radio and said, Do you hear that pack of coyotes? You better get in there quick to the dogs that way when they see you, they will run away. And I know that might sound crazy to a lot of people, but in our area of Kentucky, coyotes are hunted hard because they can cause harm to livestock so they are mostly nocturnal in our area and terrified of people. In almost every case, when a coyote sees a human, they run as fast as they can to get away from them in Kentucky. After that, I started picking up my pace trying to get into our hounds, but it was too late. Just minutes later, the pack of coyotes had made it to our hounds, and within seconds, a massive fight broke out. I heard them grab a hold of Bo, and then he started whimpering and took off running to get away from them. But not old Jake. He held his ground right next to the tree he had tracked the raccoon to. I believe he did because in his mind he might have thought the coyote was coming to take the tree away from him, but really they just wanted to eat him. Old Jake fought all over the place with the pack coyote he was holding his ground for a while, but soon after the whole dynamic of the struggle changed and the coyotes were starting to fight old Jake as a pack. My grandfather called me again, get in there quick, they're going to kill him. So I started running through the forest, scared for my dog's life. Suddenly again the fight changed and Bo had circled back around and came back to help old Jake fight the pack of coyotes, and once again old Jake was holding his ground, Oregon. So I thought. The coyotes were whimpering and screaming, and it was just pure mayhem in the woods, an absolute battle. I soon made it to old Jake, and once I shined my flashlight on him, he had a coyote by the throat, then let go once he saw me. It then took off running along with the rest of the pack. I walked over to old Jake, bent over, patted him on the head and checked him out, showing a few cuts and gashes on him, but overall was in good shape, being that he was just in a fight with a pack of coyotes, and lived. Just in front of us was a huge black oak tree, and behind it I heard the sound of a coyote whimpering and doing what I would call a blood gargle, choking on its own blood. Old Jake and I walked around to check it out, thinking that around this tree we would see that Bo had killed a coyote. But once we could see, I then noticed that it wasn't Bo, wasn't Bo at all. It was a great big dog, really broad, bigger than the size of a St. Bernard. Then it turns and looks at me while holding a dead coyote in its mouth by the rib cage, and no part of the dead coyote was touching the ground. I stopped and just looked as if we were just standing feet apart from each other, astonished. The strange dog dropped the coyote out of its mouth and looked at me. That's when I realized how much I underestimated the massive size of this animal. It leaned in forward, then stood up on its hind legs. In a really slow motion, 
that I can only describe as if you've ever seen an elderly person trying to get up out of a rocking chair. At this moment I thought it was leaning against something and that was the only logical explanation. This thing then takes two steps forward while standing on two legs. That's when I noticed the chest because it didn't have a dog's chest. It had the chest of a man, an abdomen. Then the hands caught my attention because it was moving them up beside itself, and the hands more similar to that of a man but more like claws. I saw its face was a charcoal colored with solid black eyes of eternal darkness, with blood coating dripping down its mouth to its chest like hot candle wax running down a wick. So much blood not like the blood you would normally see in any type of animal fight. It was more so like it was eating the coyote alive during the previous attack before I arrived. Again the creature takes another step towards me, and I break out into a cold sweat. My mind finally realizing what I was looking at was a damn werewolf that is not supposed to be of this world. The feeling in my mind was just absolute horror, as if the world around me no longer existed, and I was in some sort of overwhelming sense of dread. Just in a millisecond, my fight-or-flight emotion kicked in, and I jumped back and started to run. I am shining my flashlight forward as I run, and then back behind me over and over to see what is happening. During this time the sounds of my oversized gumboots were clicking loudly in the stillness of the night, and the crunching of the dead leaves beneath each stride that I took. The creature then begins to chase after me, moving at a pace I have never seen, but soon after the monster took only a few steps, old Jake hid into him, lunging his body weight towards the dogman-type creature that made a loud thud noise of old Jake's body weight slamming into the monster, snapping his jaws together and growling, trying to protect me from any harm. As I shined my light behind me, the werewolf just pushed old Jake off of him with one hand, like he was just a gnat, fly, or a flea, like he was nothing, and it didn't bother the creature at all while old Jake rolled back on the ground four or five feet. Then the creature continued to chase me like I was the only thing in the world it was interested in. I started to yell out, Put it to him, Jake. Put it to him. Come on, you can do it. As I continued to run for my life with my gun still strapped to my back only being a twenty-two caliber rifle that would cause no harm to this creature other than maybe just pissing it off even worse, I stood at five feet ten inches, and this creature towered over me at least two more feet in height. As I am running finally once again, old Jake attempts to stop him as it chases me throwing his own body weight into the monster, and like the first time it pushes him aside with ease. And back to the chase, the werewolf went in my direction as I ran. It had its mind set on me and me alone. I am running with everything I can run with all the energy my legs can produce through the forest, towards the direction of the truck. And once again I started to scream, Come on, old Jake, put it to him. Get him, Jake, get him. Come on, Jake, I need you. As this thing was gaining ground on me quickly. And for the third time, old Jake comes in towards the monster and hits him again with his body weight. And once he did, I heard a loud popping noise, and what I call the jaws of death locked down on the creature. Before I turned around, I just knew that old Jake had finally made good contact with the monster, and that's when I saw Jake had his mouth latched onto the hip of the werewolf just hanging there on it like a chihuahua on a mailman. That was the size difference because old Jake was just nowhere near the same size as this animal. The monster then stopped and grabbed old Jake with both of its hands. And as sure as I am telling you this story now, it threw old Jake through the woods like a bag of garbage. I could see old Jake's body flying through the air, hitting low-hanging tree branches, leaves, and brush. I knew at that point old Jake was dead. It was just me and the monster at this moment. And I continued to run with tears rolling down my face, and a sense of both sorrow and dread with the thoughts in my mind, that this thing just killed my dog. I am all alone, no one here to save me, not even Daniel Boone himself can come up from the grave and help me at this point. I am a goner for sure. The monster then continued to run on after me at this point. It's so close to me I can feel the heat on the back of my neck. I am trying to run in a zigzag type of movement. While being overwhelmed with emotion, I started yelling once again, Come on, old Jake, please, I need you. Put it to him. Jake put it to him. But no matter how many times I yelled and screamed for help, none came. He was gone. I stumbled over a fallen tree branch and fell face down on my belly into an old treetop that had blown over in the forest, maybe after a storm or something. Rolled over on my back and the creature dropped down on all four feet, 
and I started to crawl back into the mangled tree branches and decaying leaves while the monster continued to pursue me. At this point the animal and I were at point-blank range, just a couple of feet from each other, snapping its mouth and snarling the blood from the freshly killed coyote still dripping down its mouth, mixed in with snot and drool while blowing its breath right on me with the smell of rot and decay coming with it. Meanwhile, the whole time I am continuing to yell, Come on, Jake, come on. I knew at that time this was it, this was the end, and I was trying to crawl for my life backward while facing the animal just trying to find a way out. And as the creature was now in range to grab a hold of me suddenly out of nowhere, old Jake hits the monster broadside throwing his body weight into the creature, and it rolls over on its back. Jake climbs up on top of it and just starts mauling him, snapping his jaws, just munching on this monster. Old Jake was really putting the hurt to this dog from hell. I heard Jake's jaws locked down someplace on the creature, and the sound of bones crushing. The monster let out a painful howl that felt like it rattled the very earth I was crawling on. That's when I realized, this is my chance, and I stood up and ran across the mountain once again. I could hear the whole time the battle that was taking place behind me, and I was no longer looking back. But unfortunately the situation changed, and I could hear the monster finally turn back on old Jake and sounded like it was just ripping him to pieces. He was letting out painful barks and whimpers, making my stomach turn into knots, hearing the pain old Jake was going through. At this time I came upon a clearing not far from the truck, and I turned around, took the rifle off of my back, and began to fire into the air POW, 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 the gunshots echoed off the mountains around me. I started yelling, come on, Jake, come on, please come on, let's go. But the forest went completely silent, and it seemed no noises at all could be heard. I ran down to the truck, opened up the door, and climbed inside. My grandfather said, what on earth is going on? I said, just drive, we have to go, we have to get out of here. Then started telling him what happened, every detail I could, as I was trembling in pure terror. Calmly, my grandfather said, Listen, if you want to hunt, fish, and do stuff as a man, then you need to realize that there are things in the woods that I cannot explain, and you have to come to terms with that if you want to continue to live this lifestyle. In his humbling words, he then said, Since you are so upset, I will go ahead and take you home, but we will come back in the morning to look for Bo and old Jake. I said, No point in coming back. I heard what happened. Old Jake is dead, Papa. He is gone. He fought for my life, but he just didn't make it. Once again, my grandfather spoke, saying, If everything you said is true, then you owe it to old Jake to at least come back in the morning and look for him. He fought tooth and nail for your life. And as a boy of just fifteen years old, what my grandfather said was both the law and the truth to me. Every single word was one of wisdom and knowledge well beyond my years. We drove home, and I didn't sleep very much at all the rest of the night knowing as soon as day broke we were going to drive back out to that area to look for our hounds. Meanwhile, still being filled with mixed emotions about the event that had happened just hours before, feeling everything from fear to heartbreak an absolutely traumatic event. But as the morning came and the fog was lifting from the mountains, we loaded up in the truck and traveled back out to the location we had been hunting the night before. My grandfather got out of the truck and I just rolled my window down, and we both began to call for our dogs. Here, Jake, here, let go home. We also yelled for Bo, but he had run far away when the coyotes had bitten him. So at that time, I wasn't that worried about him. We would drive up and down the gravel road, repeating the same actions time and time again with no luck. So my grandfather said we would go home and return that evening to try once more. And that evening, when we drove back to where we last saw our hounds, we started to call and whistle for them again. On down the road a little bit, we could hear something moving through the forest, coming out towards the road, and once it stepped out, my grandfather said, Hey, Bo, just came out of the woods, that big red tick dog of yours, so grab your dog leash and go get him. I said, All right, Papa, started to walk towards Bo, that was just barely moving slowly, and as I got closer to him, then realizing that wasn't Bo, it was old Jake, covered from head to toenail in blood, some dry, most still moist. His injuries were beyond severe. Anyone who would have seen him at that time would question how he was even standing with a couple of broken bones and major flesh wounds across his body. But he was alive. 
my grandfather walked over to and grabbed all 120 pounds of old Jake's mangled body, picked him up and carried him over to the vehicle, then put him in the back of the truck. I had never seen my grandfather do something like that because he was a tough love type of a guy, but he was just as heartbroken at that moment as I was. Then we drove out of Daniel Boone National Forest back to the farm. Most people, I believe, would have probably, with a dog that was so severely injured, put him out of his misery and buried him. But we didn't. My mama did a lot of veterinarian work with our animals on our farm, and somehow, against all odds, she was able to doctor old Jake up and pretty much bring him back to life. From that moment on, old Jake and I had a special bond we were always best friends, and he lived a long and happy life. I will never forget what old Jake did for me that night in the Battle of the Backwoods, and if a dog loves its human enough they will battle something that is unbeatable to keep you safe from harm. I gave up on old Jake's life multiple times that terrible night, and he fought for me over and over again. That was a really hard thing to live with on top of the trauma I was not ready for at that time in my life. And if it weren't for the wisdom of my humble grandfather, then we would have lost old Jake forever. Both of them have now left this world and been called way up yonder to hopefully hunt in the hills of heaven. You can say what you want to say about what terrifies you the most, but to me it will always be the thing I saw. I guess you can say it was a dogman, werewolf, hellhound, skinwalker. I am not really sure. But what I do know is it bled and felt pain just like any other animal in the world, and so I know what I saw was tangible and real. By the way, about a week later someone found Bo at a local country store and I was able to also get him back as well. If you don't have anyone to lend you a helping hand in a dire situation, then I pray you will at least bring a paw to pull you out as I did that October night. My best friend and I have hunted and fished the areas around his land for years and have experienced many odd and suspicious things. This particular night didn't seem special or significant at first, but this was the first legitimate experience I had. We were at a father and son camp out that a local church puts on every year. I was there with my dad, of course, and I was about seventeen, and my best friend was sixteen, I believe. We were sitting alongside one of the two ponds on the property fishing and talking quietly late into the night. Everyone had set up camp around the fire except for myself and my dad. We thought it would be fun to drive his yellow Mazda Sportster down the land bridge between the two ponds and camp up in a field behind the edge of the forest there. Now before I continue, I need to point out that this forest butts up against my best friend's land as well, just a few miles north. There's also a huge wildlife reserve that contains a rather large Native American burial site that borders my friend's land and has its own stories and local legends. As my friend and I were sitting there fishing, we were playing with my airsoft guns I had brought with me to plink around with. They obviously didn't offer much protection, but sitting outside in the middle of nowhere at 2.30 a.m. and having them felt somewhat comforting. We were sitting on the opposite side of the pond from where my dad and I set up camp. The moon was bright and full, so we could see very clearly without flashlights. The fire glowed in the distance behind us about 120 yards away. The land bridge was to our left about 50 yards away and the pond being about forty-five to fifty yards wide and a banana shape in length, it wrapped around to the right of us. My friend and I stopped talking at the same time as we heard something bizarre. We listened intently as we heard what sounded like two muffled voices coming from the tree line across the pond in front of us. My initial thought was some kind of cult or witches performing a ritual in the woods. Turns out I wasn't too far off. The sound traveled from the far right of the tree line to directly in front of us, then to the left, then it centered again in front of us. We were both a little creeped out and getting the chills, but we were rationalizing it to be some other campers walking around in the woods talking quietly. I mean, we probably weren't the only ones crazy enough to be out there like that, right? The woods lit up with light as my dad turned on his car. He was pulling down the path to the land bridge in a panic. I got up and started running over to meet the car when it got down to our side of the pond. He stopped and was clearly upset, asking me why I was messing with him and what was I saying to him from the woods. I told him where I was and what I was doing all night and I wasn't in the woods or trying to mess with him. He looked confused and said he was going to try to go back to sleep, but that he was going to sleep in the car up by the other campers. I could tell he was weirded out, and if something was messing with the tent or yelling at him from the woods, 
It was too far for me to hear or know anyway. We continued sitting by the pond now, curious to what was actually going on. About fifteen minutes later we heard a loud splash come from the runoff creek for the pond. It's in the woods on the other side of the pond. I said it was probably a deer just to keep my nerves calm, but my friend looked at me and said, Asa, deer don't go in the water at night because they can't see how deep it is. I froze and started silently praying for protection. My friend said he thought he seen something for a second, but I didn't get a look at it. Then we both heard it. The scream. It was straightforward out of a nightmare. So feral and evil it made us both jump and sprint up the, the campfire. I don't remember anything except for how hard my heart and blood were pumping during that sprint. But let me tell you, it was the most terrifying thing you'd ever hear in your life. There actually is a video on YouTube by Big Dill of someone capturing a skinwalker scream very similar to the one I heard. Things got weirder that morning. We walked out there before anyone else got up to look for signs of what it was. We found huge tracks of what looked like massive wolf paws. But the strange thing was, it had eight toes. I'm 23 now and have had a few more strange and odd encounters with these skinwalkers. There is two that I know of one being all black and like a wolf, and the other is white like fresh snow, but still takes the form of a humanoid wolf. I've had full body apparitions of medicine men and tribal people while hunting and hiking. I haven't gone on a hike with my friend in some time now, but every time I do I carry and real weapon with me just in case. My friend has had it worse than me with these experiences. He's had tapping on windows, claw marks in screen doors, an arm reach in second story windows, and being followed and stalked through the woods on a regular occurrence. This has been an ongoing thing, and I have other detailed first-hand experiences I'd like to share. This one being the first. All I can say is this world is a strange one. It's a warm Georgia night with a cool breeze and a clear sky. I was with my sister. For this story, we will just call her Kay. Me and Kay decided we would go exercising at the track at 10 p.m. due to the fact it was a quiet night. We packed out gear and headed out, knowing her she'd had some stories to tell on the way. On this night, she wouldn't know we'd have a story of our own. As we are driving to the track, we are having idle chat about things going on in our town. I decided to ask Kay if she knew anything of skinwalkers or any myth or legend. Kay really didn't know anything of skinwalkers, but to my surprise she knew of wendigos. One thing that did make me uneasy on this ride to the track is the fact the roads were empty and hardly any lights on. I brushed it off and figured everyone called it an early night in town. We reached the track a bit earlier than expected, no cars in sight, no lights on at all, but one next to the parking spaces. We did our warm-ups and stretches before doing our five laps, but one thing was off. It was dead silent. Again I decided to brush it off due to the fact the track was next to building so no wildlife would be around. As we finished our warm-ups I decided to let Kay have a head start to let her work at her own pace. I joined in after her. Everything was great, not until the fourth lap. As I began my fourth lap I noticed Kay was on the other side of the track on the left-hand side of me, but not too far apart. That's when I heard a gentle but very scratched or drowned voice in the bushes on the right side of me. The worst part of this voice is the fact it was Kay's voice asking if I wanted to check something out in the bushes. My mind went completely blank with fear, but to my instinct or whatever the hell was going on in my head, I completely ignored the voice and cut through the track to let Kay know we need to go. She was very confused but thankfully out of energy and ready to go. As I helped her walk through the dark and back to the car, I hear something behind us. I noticed I left my duffel bag on the chairs and went back to get the duffel bag as Kay got the car ready to go. At that moment, time around me was going slower. Then a feather falling, I saw Kay bellow the light just twenty meters in front of me. I hid behind a bricked water fountain, but enough so I can see it with my own eyes. I was petrified. It was Kay, but her skin looked like it wasn't even her own. She was wearing something resembling deer skin. My mind went completely white with fear at the sight of this thing. As soon as I reach for my duffel bag, I see it twist its neck at a neck-breaking speed to look at me. I could not move. The fear in me was holding me stronger than I could ever imagine. As I look at it longer, it began to look more like something you would hear in horror stories. That's when its mouth opened, 
and Kay's voice came out and told me to come over here and help. I began to get up and move slowly back, feeling like an eternity just making eye contact with this thing. As I felt the warmth of the car behind me, the only single light to the track shut off as soon as I see this monstrosity move towards me. I began to feel beads of sweat pour down my face as I began to panic and get into the car, and tell Kay calmly, let's leave now so I would not worry her or possibly scare her. We quickly left as soon as I told her we were ready to leave. I looked back to see the single light turn back on, but to my surprise there was nothing there at all. I sighed in relief once we got back into the center of town. As a few days pass, I asked Kay if she ever tried calling out to me at the track. She told me no. It made me uneasy, but I was happy we were safe at home. To this day, people say they feel uneasy at the track when doing laps at night when by themselves or with friends. I know personally I will never return to that track at night or early in the morning before sunrise. I still wonder if what I saw was really in my mind or was it actually there. The Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anasazi's origins and departure. According to Navajo legend, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, and food, and went into another dimension or some equivalent. But whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander in Anasazi ruins. I never asked why, but figured it had something to do with disrespect, preserving history, etc. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with my naked eye. And I got this strange fixation on going over there. I am not Navajo, and felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set off down the cliffs without rope and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was like some obsession. I can't explain the feeling. It was like magnetism. I wanted to be in those ruins, and it wasn't just some tourist-like curiosity. It felt like I was meant to go there. I kept slipping and getting stuck on the rocks, and I was so frustrated I almost started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there, so I couldn't see what was making the growl, but Mountain Lion immediately rose to mind, and I got my ass back up the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shot the guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was while Sarah was aiming. Things got eerily quiet. We all heard a sound from behind us, maybe twenty feet away. It was almost a growl, then a hoarse laugh, almost like a lion and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area, and there was nothing there, certainly not on the cliff tops where we heard it anyway. The creepy part was that while David, Sarah, and I all heard it from a close distance, Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out there to see if anything would happen, and this is when I got completely terrified. Before I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns, though, and were sleeping with no bags or tents, just some blankets under the stars and a little fire, so I felt safe when we all laid down. I fell asleep pretty quickly but woke up a few hours later to see everyone else laying with their eyes open wide, listening. The canyon was completely full of noises. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set, maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 yards away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock-smacking rock noises there were, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened to this for maybe 10 minutes. No other animal noises, no nothing. Finally, David, who is kind of a hard-ass and the least superstitious of his family, shouted, Shut up! And everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at each other, wide-eyed. It was dead quiet. And then we heard another super weird noise from the Anasazi ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either, but it sounded kind of like a zebra noise. Like these squeaky trills. It got louder and then the rock slash stick slash whatever started up again. But this was worse, because now other animal noises came. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching. In my opinion, those were the most terrifying. Owls hooting, and through it all that terrible zebra noises. We said nope, and got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe ten minutes to douse the fire, pack our blankets, and speed away. 
and the noises were continuing that entire time. That night I was obviously pretty shaken up. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me and said that she could tell I had a rough day. We hadn't mentioned the creepy shit to avoid a lecture about fucking with the spirits. She asked me about it and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal, it felt like. I wanted to go there. Why couldn't I go there? It would have been beautiful. After I told her all about it, I could see that she had a really concerned look on her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused, and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to lure people up. When they get up on the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public accessible kiva, kind of a tourist trap for a little podunk place. But since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down into the kiva. And I went alone, as of course my superstitious family refused to enter other natives' dwellings. I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I was in a kiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward to a few weeks later. I worked at a shitty call center in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone, and I was feeling jumpy ever since the kiva. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but I of course didn't believe it. I don't smoke, but I followed my co-workers out for smoke breaks because I like to chat. Tonight I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out the glass door and being a total weirdo. It hit me then how paranoid I had been. That's what skinwalkers do, they mess with your mind. While I was pacing in front of the glass doors, I decided that this whole thing was fucking stupid and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my ten-minute break. Most of the smokers were already filing back in, but I walked out and put my hands in my pockets. Looked at the sky, looked in the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something that I will never, ever be able to give a rational or even halfway accountable explanation for. We have, like, six parking lots. In one of the lots far away from me, maybe one hundred feet, I could see something walking. It was a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping and walked like it was tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot all about skinwalkers, and I started walking toward it, making the titch 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 come mere doggy noises. And then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound, and it was grey, but there was something very wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped, but it walked more like a person would on feet and hands. Its butt was moving to and fro, if that makes any sense. When it heard me, it just stopped, without turning, something I've never known any dog to do. And finally it looked over its shoulder at me, and this is the freaky part. This dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were bared like it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl. Noises no regular animal makes. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me or was taunting me. Somehow in the middle of all this, I realized it didn't have a tail, and I'd heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Forgetting all logic and rationality, I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was back inside the building and had pulled the doors shut behind me, and by then when I looked, of course, the fucking thing was gone. When I described this to my brothers, they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker, and they went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, them, and their apartments. I never saw the creepy bloody dog again, and I have never since even slightly wanted to visit cliff ruins. This took place two years back during the summer I had graduated high school. Since the end of that summer, I've moved for college. Anyway, to give some basic context, my high school was in a suburban setting, but the campus was surrounded by a good amount of forest. I joined the cross-country team in ninth grade, and that kind of developed my love for hiking and exploring. Often we would run on the trails that were dispersed through the forest, especially behind the high school. Some of these trails stretched for many miles. I recall the one day our coach was unable to make practice after school due to being sick. Our team captain told us we could basically free roam the forest that day and explore the forest in our own groups if we desired. This was the day I knew I would always have a desire to explore the unknown. 
That day, me and my friends were jogging around on unused trails and came across an old shack with various old tools and weapons. Nothing was unordinary besides the fact that there were a bunch of things like axes and daggers hidden inside this place, all of which were mostly in old and brittle condition. The area was abandoned and in the middle of the forest. No one seemed to have come here in a while. We didn't think much of it and labeled it as a good find. Later on that day after cross-country practice, me and two of my friends came back to the high school to explore some more. This time we went in the complete opposite direction of where the shack was and ended up finding an abandoned trailer this time. The trailer would have been that sort that you would see on the back of semis. It was at the point of dilapidation and really had nothing left to offer. Yet there was no truck in sight. That made us wonder how it got into the woods in the first place without a clear path long enough to even transport to this location. Next to the back of the truck, a single-story makeshift-looking house that was clearly the victim of a fire. The place was practically crumbling and nothing inside was worth taking a look at. However, the trailer had some interesting stuff inside. Although it was peculiar finding this stuff deep in the woods, a lot of the stuff inside the trailer was either junk that appeared to be old, or antiques that ranged from typewriters to dressers that appeared to be made back in the 1900s. We labeled this as our biggest find yet and were really excited. That wrapped up the day, though. A lot of other cool and odd things had happened in our expeditions to the forest since then, but nothing as bizarre and freakish as what I am about to tell you guys. So the purpose of stating all this was to explain how my love for hiking and exploring came into play. Since then, me and my friends have continued to go to this forest behind the high school from time to time to explore and hang out. So now, as officially graduated seniors, me and my friends decided to have one last time in those woods before we split off in our own unique directions in life. While it was a day filled with deep nostalgia and sadness, reminiscing the good old days, we also got the fright of our life. This time, we dedicated the whole day to the woods. We got ready in the morning and rode our mountain mics into the forest, bringing camp supplies and such. This day was different. We decided we were going to camp overnight in the woods. After all, we had never done that before, and as our last time coming here, we figured we'd better make it memorable. There were four of us in total. We told our parents we were going over to stay the night at one of our other friends' houses. Looing back, I kind of wish that's what we ended up doing, though. So we got there in the morning and found an area to set up camp. It was at the bottom of a really steep elevation and there was a clearing at the bottom with an already made fire pit because apparently someone had been there in the past already. There were beer cans and ammunition shells scattered everywhere. I've come to learn that this area of the forest was actually used as a shooting range back in the day. We started on our hike and pretty much screwed around all day on the trails. We graffitied a bridge about a mile down the trail where our campsite was writing stuff like so-and-so was here and such. We figured we had to document our last day and all the other days we had spent in this awesome forest before we all left for college. Pretty much when you entered the forest, there was a main path that went straight with many side paths. The area where we camped was about a quarter mile into the trail from the high school to the left. It sounded like footsteps crunching on beer cans and earth. I truthfully couldn't tell if it was on two feet or four yet, but I just assumed it was an animal walking around the campsite in search of food or something. That's when I realized we were complete idiots for not cleaning up after ourselves and putting our stuff away before dozing off. But no, I was far from guessing right. At least I think I was. I hadn't made a single motion since I had woken, and even worse, whatever was near us, it was not facing in my direction. So I was completely vulnerable to whatever this thing was. That's when I suddenly heard a new set of footsteps approaching the campsite. There was dead silence besides these footsteps rummaging around our campsite. This is when I made out whatever these things were, to be bipedal. The crickets and frogs in this area ceased to make noise at this point. A few moments later, everything was dead silent, including the noise of whoever was in our camping area. The sounds of these footsteps stopped as suddenly as they came. I lifted my body up to look frantically around the campsite and woke up my friends. I noticed that the embers had been put out by water, which none of us had done, and smoke was gently wafting into the air. We were in almost complete darkness. I reached for my phone and saw that it was two in the morning now. 
It's as if whatever these things were knew the moment that we had all fallen asleep. The fire being put out must have happened right before I woke up. My friends were all awake at this point, questioning why I had woken them all up. All I could say was I heard footsteps by our campsite, but they were audibly gone now. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an ear-piercing scream shot out into the air from the path taken to get to our camp spot at the higher elevation. As I looked into that general direction, I could see at the top of the trail something looking down at us. Another scream rang out. It almost sounded like an Aztec death whistle if I were to compare it to something, yet it was much lower in tone, with an almost insect-like clicking noise to it. I nearly crapped myself, that's how taken aback I was. We were in utter shock, unable to move. That's when it hit me. Where was the other thing? It had accompanied that figure at the camp. Was it near us? I only saw one at the top of the trail. I never found out, though. Whatever was at the top of the trail had now begun to skulk off further deep into the woods towards the bridge. All I could make out was its tall, slender silhouette. Where its eyes were supposed to be were two small, eerily green reflecting slits. I was scared beyond my wits at this point and told everyone we were going to make a run for it. After all, we weren't too far from the high school, about a quarter mile away, give or take. We ditched everything and fled. We decided we would come back for anything we left the next day with a bigger group of people. We ran straight out of the woods, not hearing anything else besides our footsteps. We all sneaked into my friend's basement through an emergency hatch and stayed there for the rest of the night, making sure to lock and secure any form of entry out of paranoia due to what we just witnessed. Never in my life had I experienced something as terrifying as that. Never in my life had I seen or heard anything remotely similar to the sound of whatever it was we heard that night. We went back two days later and found everything there intact. However, two of the four bikes had been thrown around and scratched. Our sleeping bags were shredded and slung upon tree branches way up high. Everything was just a disturbing mess. The forest had resumed with its sound of nature, signifying that anything dangerous was most likely far off. Whatever was out there that night had come back and attempt to find us again, but only found the remains of what we left behind. What I'll ever know is why those things were near our camp or in the forest, and what their ultimate goal was in coming near us. I mean, maybe it could have been some sort of group of messed up people, but the idea of that just really seems far off. It wouldn't fully explain all the incidents that happened that night. I also learned that there was an ancient cemetery somewhere along the path if you went straight past the bridge a few miles on a discreet side path. My cross-country captain apparently found it with a few others when I mentioned the whole incident on a group chat. Maybe they were ghosts or wendigos. I really have no idea. Regardless, I still have trouble thinking about to this day, but I know deep down that whatever happened that night, whatever those creatures were, they had bad intentions and were likely pure evil. I've been thinking about this series of events for the last couple of weeks. As a backstory, I attended an academic stay-away summer camp in North Carolina every summer for six years, despite living 500 miles away. In my second to last year, the camp had moved one of its programs to a different college campus. This college was a private Baptist school. The college was established in the mid-1800s and has some questionable history. It's notorious to the area. Many established KKK members attended the school and burned down an all-black elementary school in the 60s, killing several children. At the time this event occurred, I was not aware of any of the questionable events that transpired there. Because of my circumstances at the time, I arrived to camp the night before the program began. There were plenty of staff members at the college, but my counselor wasn't one of them. She had car troubles earlier that day and wouldn't arrive until the next morning. This meant that I would be all alone on my floor. The girls that year would be staying on the fourth floor, the boys on the third, and staff on the second floor. This meant that there was only one person on the floor below me, and I was all alone on the top floor. The dorm I was staying in was built in the 60s and wasn't taken care of that well. Most things were stained yellow or faded from being over 50 years old. The floors and the doors were extremely creaky but only if they were being moved on or touched. The doors smelled musty, like an old bookstore, and there was plenty of mold to go around. 
There was no air conditioning or heating systems, few outlets, and worn-down locks on the windows and doors. The dorm had great acoustics, making it very echoey. I had spent most of that evening unpacking and setting my room up. Around 10.30 I changed into pajamas and started to read a book to keep myself occupied, since the cell reception in the mountains was awful, and I knew I wouldn't be going to bed any time soon. Around 11.30 I heard the doors at the end of the hall slamming shut, and the endless echo as it traveled down the hall. I went to look out the peephole and saw nothing. This was mildly unnerving because I knew I would have heard someone's footsteps leading up to the door slamming since the building was so noisy, and that was the only unlocked hallway door on that floor. I soon forgot about it and tried going to bed a little past midnight. I started to feel extremely scared for no apparent reason. The room just felt heavy and my heart started racing. I felt like I wasn't alone. I wrote it off as the heat, considering it was early July in the rainforest of the Appalachian Mountains, and I had no air conditioning or fans. After a while of tossing and turning and convincing myself to calm down, I finally went to bed. I woke up around 3.30 a.m., jerking into consciousness, like I had just woken up from a nightmare. I instantly had a bad feeling like I was alone just before I'd fallen asleep. The room was extremely heavy and I could feel someone's presence. My chest was extremely heavy and I couldn't find an ounce of courage in me to get up. I was paralyzed with fear and found myself staring in the corner across my bed. I could see a dark figure, which seemed to be that of a frail person crouched in the fetal position, rocking back and forth. The entire time I remained in my bed, I couldn't take my eyes off of the dark figure. During this whole experience, I refused to move and took shallow breaths. I knew I wasn't experiencing sleep paralysis during this event because I had experienced it before, also at this summer camp, but at a different campus. I was able to move, but I refused to because of the figure. I was also being taken over with fear, like nothing I had experienced before like I was going to die, like I was hiding from someone else being hunted. Looking back, I believe this was energy being exuded from the figure in the corner. I think it's important to mention that I was 16 at the time of this occurrence. Prior to this experience, I was very skeptical of supernatural beings, whether that be ghosts, demons, spirits, or any entity. I was raised atheist and in a family that believes everything has a scientific explanation. I had several friends growing up that were firm believers in ghosts and the supernatural. They would often tell me about their experiences, but I had never truly believed them due to my upbringing. I thought that they were highly imaginative, and that they didn't always think about what the most rational explanation was. After this experience, I was hesitant to even mention it to any of my friends at summer camp. I thought that they wouldn't believe me just like I hadn't believed in my friends when they told me their supernatural experiences. After a week or so, I had finally mentioned the occurrence to my friend. She was native to the area and had shared some of its unfortunate history with me, all of which I mentioned before. Something still didn't sit right with me, though. The campus made me uneasy, especially the dorm I was staying in. Once I returned home, I did some research on the college. I simply looked up deaths associated with the college. Like plenty of universities, there had been many deaths occurring at the college, most of them being from alcohol poisoning, suicides, or car accidents. The one that truly stuck out to me was the case of a woman who had been sexually assaulted and murdered in the mid-70s. The cause of death was from internal bleeding caused by falling from a height or being projected through a car window during an accident. The woman was also raped and her body was dragged onto a nature trail located directly behind the dorm I was staying in. To this day, her murder remains unsolved. I firmly believe my experience was linked to her spirit. I believe the fear and hostility I felt in the air that night was the woman reliving how she had felt on the last night of her life, or the fear an entity clinging to her was instilling in me. I pray that this woman's soul reaches peace, that she is laid to rest, and given the justice she deserves. It all started in a beautiful little campground, Lash Trailer Park in southeastern Ontario. It is used as a recreation and relaxation spot in the summer and fall by people who just want to get away from the world for a little while. It usually closes up in October for the winter and reopens in the late spring once the river is out of danger of flooding the campground. 
My friend, we will call her Kay, and her family had purchased a quaint little trailer in this park in the late 1990s to get away from the military base we lived on and get out of the city and into the countryside. As Kay and I were inseparable, I was invited every single weekend while we were in school and for weeks on end in the summertime to go along with them and enjoy the countless adventures we got ourselves into. We would sometimes go down to the campground's main office and rent paddle boats to paddle around the river and take in the sun, or go to the beach and swim with some of our new friends. We even rented a canoe once with absolutely no idea what we were doing, but we didn't care. We had so much fun anyway. Life was perfect here. It was beautiful, and the people were nice to us. We never had any issues. Because this place was primarily retired adults, there were no late-night shenanigans either, so sleeping was always peaceful after a long day of fun. I stress this fact because of this story. Let me first explain the sleeping arrangements. The trailer was about the size of one-and-a-half pickup trucks, so it was relatively small. Standing in the door into the trailer, to the left, was a small kitchenette against the wall, and at the end of the trailer there was a set of bunk beds. The bottom was a double, and the top, a single. To the right, from the same position, was a kitchen table with booth-style seats on either side. This table folded down and turned into a double bed as well, sliding the cushions of the booth seat down as a mattress. Kay's mom and dad slept in the bottom bunk bed. Her brother slept above them on the single. Kay and I would sleep inside if it was raining or thundering, but when it was nice, we would sleep outside in the four-person tent. We had a small battery-powered radio, two fluffy sleeping bags, food, and all the time in the world. One beautiful starry night, we sat around the campfire talking about anything and everything while roasting hot dogs and marshmallows. You know, the typical camping dream. As we were discussing some things about Kay's stepdad's life, like what it was like deployed to Rwanda, life as an army medic, etc., all of which was very interesting and sad, I happened to glance to my left as I had heard someone approaching in the damp grass. It was ankle-high, so it made a slight swishing sound as you strode through it. When I looked to my left, I saw a man standing just a bit off from the fire, what I thought to be just out of the firelight, which now that I think about it, he was about three feet away from me, so he shouldn't have been out of the light at all. He was completely shadowed. He had a wide-brimmed hat on, and he had a very defining nose, as I could see him from the side profile. I turned back to the fire, as it was a very quick glance, then did a double take. He was still there. He adjusted his hat as I stared at him and spat or tossed something into the fire. I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. I followed this small object, not bigger than a ball of gum, and watched it land in the fire, and then was just gone. Just gone. I looked back, and he was nowhere to be seen, no footsteps leaving from by my side. I had chills. I thought I was crazy hallucinating anything but sane. I looked back into the fire to see if that object was in there. I knew it had to be because I watched him direct it there. It was. This small thing burned quietly at the edge of the fire pit, away from the major flames but close enough to have ignited. It was as small as a ball of chewed gum, or maybe it was a rolled-up bit of foil from a wrapper. There it was, burning. By this point my absence from the conversation had been noticed, and Kay's mom asked me if I was okay. I had been looking everywhere but at them, and it was abnormal for me. I told them what I had seen, and Kay's mother could hardly believe it until I showed her the burning piece in the fire. She had been watching me as I was directly in front of her, and she knew we had nothing like that to pitch into the fire, nor did she see me flick anything into it. Not to mention, it burned differently than anything we had previously tossed into the fire. Almost like how a rubber ball might burn, I'd guess. She simply said that it was freaky, and that they were turning in. Kay and I turned in as well, and the rest of the night was without incident. Skip ahead a few weeks later, Kay and I are in our tent. It's a beautiful moonlit night in the late summer. We had just turned. And since Kay's parents were a bit tipsy from some adult beverages, and they had forgotten to put out the fire, but that was fine. It couldn't catch anything, really. It was too dewy. More light for us to stay awake and talk about boys and other stupid things that thirteen-year-olds talk about. By this point, most of the trailer park was gone, as people were getting back to work. It was midweek and holidays were over. School was starting in about a week, so this was our last hurrah. 
It suddenly got very loud. It sounded like there was a party of thirty-plus people in the yard, and they were almost chanting or singing. Then the drums started. They were so loud, thundering in the yard. We could see the fire flare up and go down as the wind tore through it. Up until then the weather had been beautiful and the wind quiet. Kay and I froze mid-sentence and didn't move a muscle. Our breath was caught as we sat helplessly. We were too afraid to scream for her stepdad, too afraid to look outside because we knew there was no one there, no one down the small desolate strip where our trailer was parked. This lasted for almost twenty minutes before the shadow of a cat walked in front of our tent door. It stopped, even though we were motionless and silent, and turned its head and stared at us without seeing us as the tent door was closed. It stared for what felt like eternity, then walked away. Silence followed. Kay and I were still frozen and tense. Our bodies ached as we had froze propped up on our side. I thought my shoulder would collapse or my arm might break. We didn't have the courage to move for at least another ten minutes, and that first movement was to collapse in our sleeping bags. Needless to say, we didn't sleep until the sun was coming up and we heard a rooster crowing on the far side of the river. We continued going to the campground for a, another year before her parents sold it because they were moving away. It was a shame to lose it, but we will always have the memories of Riverbend, the good and the bad. I haven't told anyone but my best friend this story, and even he thinks I'm crazy. But I know what I saw, and I know whatever it was, it wasn't friendly. To preface this, I live in Tennessee and have all my life. As a kid, I was in the Boy Scouts, mostly to make my mother proud, but that is neither here nor there. Here in Tennessee, we have a big scout camp called Camp Bucktums. It's a massive camp with gun ranges, archery, and everything for Big Scout fans and whatnot. I was never a fan, but I was made to go as my troop was going. I think it was in 2010, a long time ago. There were several other troops there in many other campgrounds, with hundreds of kids and adults in different campgrounds, with any bathrooms a decent walk from the campsite, and showers even further away. My first day there I felt like I was being watched whenever I was walking alone. Mind you, the buildings were far and few between, and it was mostly dense Tennessee forest. The feeling never faded the second day there, but even that couldn't have prepared me for the third day. Every day after supper, the troop was to shower in a community shower with each other. Being a shy person, I didn't really like that, so I asked if I could wait. The scoutmaster told me yes, but if I waited I was going to have to walk to the showers alone. I argued about the buddy system and got told that scoutmasters don't have time to wait on the picky, so I swallowed my pride and waited. About forty-five minutes later my troop came back and it was getting dark. It was about 7.30 p.m. in the evening, and I gathered my things and began to walk. Being one to talk to myself when frustrated, I vented to myself as I walked not noticing until about halfway to the showers that the normally active woods around me had gone silent. Now, I'm not a hunter or whatnot, but even as a kid, you know silence is often a bad sign. So I picked up speed and continued my way to the showers. Then I heard a low, raspy growl and the sound of rustling leaves. Me being a kid, I was scared and began to run, hiding quickly in the shower building which had a towel closet one person could fit in with some squeezing. I squeezed in and shut the door as quietly as I could as I heard the sounds getting closer, then quiet. For about two minutes it was quiet. I stayed as quiet as I could, and through a crack in the door I saw a tall, pale thing. It looked like a human but with no lips, hair, and horribly skinny. Its hands were spindly, and the tips looked like claws. Its teeth were reddish-yellow, and its gums were black. It stepped into the building and walked around growling and hissing in a raspy tone. I shook and almost began to cry. Then it slipped back out the door. I stayed hidden for so long, I couldn't bring myself to step out. I shut my eyes and simply waited to be found. Eventually I was found by another troop and walked back after their scoutmaster let me use the master's shower near their camp. I never went back and left the scouts that same month after my mom gave approval. Listen well, never walk in the woods around that camp alone, and if you hear a raspy growl, turn and run back to your camp. Don't test fate or your luck like I did. This happened in the fall of 2000 in Indiana, myself and my best friend, let's call him Jim, 
decided to go camping in the woods behind his grandparents' farm. That Friday, Jim and I set out to his grandparents' farm to do our yearly campout. Once we arrived, we unloaded the truck and started down the trail out in the back part of the yard. We hiked for about an hour or so before we got to our camping spot. Once there, we did all the normal things like setting up the tent and gather wood for a fire. Later that night, Jim and I sat by the fire talking about the school year so far and Jim's nut job of a girlfriend before heading off to bed for the night. We were in our tent for about two hours when something hit the side of our tent. Jim shot up looking like he just crapped himself. We both looked at one another trying to figure what had just happened. Sitting there for a couple of minutes waiting to see if it would happen again, but nothing. So we both laid back down and passed out. Later on that night something hit our tent again. This time instead of just sitting there with dumb looks on our faces, I told Jim to grab his hunting knife and I grabbed my twenty-two. I slowly opened the tent, then poked my head out, looking around to see if anything was outside. When finally satisfied that it was clear, I climbed out of the tent and started to walk around the perimeter of the camp, with Jim following behind. While looking around, I heard what sounded like twigs snapping under someone's footsteps. I slowly started to walk in the direction of the sounds from deeper in the pitch-black forest. We walked around for around thirty minutes before heading back to the camp. When we finally arrived back at our camp, it was in shambles. Our tent had been thrown across the camp, our supplies tossed about as if something had been looking for something. Being hard-headed teens, we cleaned up the camp and set the tent back up, and then went back to bed for the night. Just before dawn, I woke up to branches falling to the ground with large thuds. I sat there for some time, listening to the sounds of the woods. After a bit, I was satisfied that the wind was making the branches fall, so I laid back down. Not even five minutes later, something came rushing out of the woods, smacking the poles of the tent, shattering them like toothpicks, causing the tent to fall on top of us. I grabbed my twenty-two and tried to make my way to the door of the tent when something suddenly hit me, knocking me to my ass and right on top of Jim. Not knowing what the hell was going on, Jim grabbed his hunting knife and blindly slashed at the side of the tent. In a panic, we both made our way out of the sliced-up tent and ran for his grandparents' farm. It seemed like it took forever to finally get there, but when we saw the pick H light, we busted through the door and locked it behind us. That morning, Jim's grandpa looked at us and said, What, y'all too scared to stay out there all night? We told him what happened and what we heard. He grabbed his shotgun and we all headed back to the camp to check it out. Once we arrived back at camp, everything was destroyed. While looking around, I heard Jim call my name with straight horror in his voice. I ran over and stopped right in my tracks when I saw what he was looking at. The tent had blood and fur where Jim had been slashing at the tent. After gathering our stuff, we went back to the farm and have never been back in those woods again. A cool autumn morning in mid-October is where our story begins, in a small but quaint town near Clemson County, where the Tougaloo River stands. My friends and I, L and J, went up to the mountainous region to enjoy a weekend full of camping. What we planned to do, aside from lodging and camping out in a rustic cabin, was to hike the vast trails and rugged terrain, to hunt for our meals, and to sleep underneath the stars. Our trip was planned in advance, and as such all of us thought we had everything covered, every contingency prepared for, but as we would later discover, we were horrifically wrong in that assumption of ours. Our first morning in the mountains was met with a beautiful sunrise, the likes of which I doubt any of us had ever seen before. Steadily it rose to grace us, blessing all its light touched with warmth and a loving radiance. Groggily I got out of bed, still exhausted from the night previous, as I was the one who drove for the last half of the trip. After waking up a little more, I got dressed and headed downstairs to meet the rest of my group, L and J. As we gathered and sat down for breakfast, we began to discuss the first thing we would do that day, laughing our asses off as we joked and prodded at one another, teasingly making jabs in an effort to get one of us to drive about the area so the others didn't have to. We finished packing for the day ahead of us and loaded into the car, the attempts at persuasion from earlier failing me as I ended up driving yet again, and so began our trek into the wilderness around us. Works for me, I thought as I drove down the winding trail. I get to see it all up front, while those two make out in the back seat. Now to each their own, I know, but I was a little bit disgruntled at them for not taking in the scenery, 
so I decided to sweeten the mood. Apparently, swerving on a winding incline was not the best course of action, even jokingly, as my prank was soon met with a hard smack to the face. What the hell, Dial? El exclaimed. Are you going to be that retarded throughout the whole trip? I chuckled. Calm down, El. I was just horsing around. I mean, since you two are having your fair share of fun, isn't it right that I get to have mine, too? El sneered and said, Don't do that again, Deal, please. You just about made me piss myself. I thought we were going to die. If you're going to joke around like that, at least make sure we're not on a narrow bend like this, okay? I sighed. Okay, sorry. My sincerest apologies to you, Your Highness. After a while, I chuckled again and said, You know, if I wanted to be lectured, I'd stay at home and have my ear talked off by my mother. We had finally reached our destination. The fallen leaves decorated the forest floor, crisply crunching underfoot as we made our way further into the hiking trail, walking deeper into the wooded realm that encompassed us. The trail was peaceful, filled with moments of silence and beauty, all of which was jovially brought to an end as Jay, being the country fan he is, began whistling a beloved tune. Soon we all chimed in singing, Take Me Home Country Roads, as none of us could resist the urge to sing along to such a camp-friendly song. We continued humming various melodies, the last descant marking the day's end as the sun began to set. The final tune escaped our lips as the moon began to rise, signifying the night's arrival, and with it, all that are subject to its rule. The full moon's pale and eerie light crept through the brambles and thickets of branches, its sickly touch sending chills down our backs, a cold shiver throughout our bodies. L began to cling to Jay, obviously frightened, and said, Dill, maybe we should get going, like right now. L's my best friend, and in the time we've known each other, whenever either one of us gets a bad feeling, we take heed and turn away from the supposed risk. Just as we started to head back in the direction of the car, a shrill cry rang out, a deafening and blood-chilling wail that snatched away whatever peace and tranquility was left in the night. We stood frozen with fear as our shackles, anxiety, and uncertainty the ball and chain. What the hell was that? Jay quickly asked, L hugging him tighter. Did you hear that, Dill? We began to scan the area around us, making out whatever we could in the pale, moonlit night, our ears twitching at every sound they heard, our hearts slowing to a rhythmic pump as we fixated on something in the distance. What appeared to be two glowing, whitish-yellow orbs were in a nearby tree. As quickly as we saw them, the orbs vanished, and that horrific wail resounded soon after, leaving us motionless from fear. Courage or stupidity took a hold of us, and we booked it back to the car, against our better judgment, as running from a predator was a bad idea due to their instinct to hunt and give chase to fleeing prey. We all came to the unified and unspoken decision that staying there with that thing was a worse idea than doing nothing. Finally, we made it. J and L got in first, then I followed suit, again in the driver's seat, and started the car. As soon as the headlights flicked on, there in the brush, just barely visible but perceivable enough to make out most of its horrific visage, stood an actual monster. There's no other word for it. The sickly, pale yellow eyes stared into our souls as we looked back with the utmost horror imaginable. Our gazes met. It knew we were terrified of it, and honestly it took pride in such a notion. Its skin was a reddened color like a tanned hide, only slightly darker, while its face, from what little we could see, was sharp and angular. On the tree next to it lay one of its grotesque hands, just as monstrous as the rest of it adorned with claws at the tips of its curled, elongated fingers. One leg was partially visible, and it was, much to our dismay, bent and misshapen. That's when we knew if this was a prank, it was the best damn prank ever, as no human leg is able to bend like that. Imagine how a dog's legs would be or some other canidae, with the knees bent backwards, heels resting off the ground, all the while as the pads of its feet lay nestled on the forest floor, its sharp claws digging into the dirt and leaves beneath where it stood. Then it cracked what appeared to be a smile, revealing rows of sharp and gnarled teeth, or dare I say fangs. All of this, as drawn out as it seems, happened in the span of a minute or two. Just as quickly as we saw it, though, it slithered away back into the brush. What the ever-loving hell was that thing? 
I asked, fear stinging my throat, tears burning my eyes. With L and J yelling at me to drive away, I snapped back to reality, threw the car into reverse, turned around and gunned it down the path. To hell if it was a narrow road, and on that notion we all agreed. After what felt like an anxiety-ridden eternity, we finally arrived back at the cabin and slowly made our way inside, not out of nonchalance or a lack of care, but from shock and exhaustion, complete and utter disbelief. We all decided to sleep in the same room that night, huddled around one another, cold and pale as the grave. L was passed out from the excitement of it all, while J was soon to follow from a rundown of his adrenaline-driven high, but I myself stayed awake for a while longer, gripping tightly onto my hunting knife as I sat on the edge of the bed. I tossed and turned, awoke at every sound that came from the woods, unable to get any decent sleep for what seemed to be hours upon hours, until I finally gave up on the idea of a well-rested night. Fuck all. I gave a defeated sigh. I can't sleep. I went downstairs for a drink and a bite to eat, still on edge as my heart pounded in my chest. There I sat in the kitchen eating my midnight snack, drinking away whatever that thing was from my memory. All of a sudden, as if on some dreadful cue, a chill runs down my back. It's the same chill I felt right before that creature showed up, a feeling of a lurking nearby danger, one that heralds the tendency for someone to proceed with an air of caution. A light tapping sounded at the window, and without thinking I turned to look. In the darkness two whitish-yellow eyes shone from outside, beaming into the cabin as whatever they belonged to searched around. Then they rose higher into the air resting almost above the window frame. Whatever this thing was, it was tall, frightfully so. It put its hand on the window, but in the moonlight it looked wet and redder than it did before, a fresh viscous substance dripping from its claws. Slowly I backed away and it did the same, but neared closer and closer to the door as it stepped from the window. Seeing the door was unlocked, I bolted for it and slammed up against it as it creaked, knocking whatever that hideous thing was away, and locking the door. I heard a slight grunt and what sounded like a growl before it spoke. Let me in, Dial, Elle said from behind the door, her voice deepening and becoming sinister in tone. There's a monster out here. Please don't let him get me. I stood there, knife in hand, tears welling in my eyes, a gasp in my throat. And then it spoke again, but this time it wasn't in Elle's voice. Jay spoke sinisterly and maliciously taunting us to open the door. Let me in, little boy. Let me in. Let me in. It slammed against the door and let out its horrific wail, that ungodly scream. Jay and L ran downstairs looking as shocked and horrified as I felt. Let me in, it demanded again in L's voice. Jay, open the door. Please, that's not me in there with you. Jay became as white as a ghost, and then L fell to the ground, passed out from fear and disbelief. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. It began to chuckle, and then spoke in my voice. If everyone else is having fun, isn't it only fair that I get my fair share too? I... I blacked out after that. Morning came, the sun creeping over the horizon, slowly rising to grace us again. This sunrise was similar to the previous morning, and we finally understood why it had risen so slowly. It wasn't a gradual, majestic sunrise. It was quite the opposite disturbed, scared, reluctant to mantle its throne in the heavens above us. We finally understood, and after packing up, we got the hell out of there and never returned. The mountains grew distant and soon faded as I drove us back home, although admittedly, I didn't mind being the driver this time. L and J refused to return there, to the sprawling mountainous forested providence of Clemson County. But one day I will. I love the woods and mountains, nature itself, too much to be deterred by whatever evil lurks within the darkness there. I just pray that when I do venture back to the Clemson County retreat, that all goes well for me, and that I come back alive and sane. Here's to hoping. This story is from my friend, who I'll name Sebastian, for privacy reasons that happened a long time ago, told in his perspective caution some parts may be confronting. My name is Sebastian, and I'm an expert camper, hunter, and fisher. I texted my friends to ask if they want to go camping to get away from all the trick-or-treaters this Halloween. My phone buzzed with replies saying yes, so I loaded up my biggest tent some other camping gear into the back of my Jeep Wrangler and headed to pick up my friends. 
I arrived at my friend's place and they tossed their stuff in the back and we headed off. The trip was long and grueling looking for a place to go camping until I noticed a trail that looked kind of used but too narrow for the jeep. So we had to hike the rest of it, so we unloaded the camping gear and set off down the narrow trail. Nature sounds filled our ears and as we walked down the trail, then suddenly all those sounds stopped and a strong smell of death and decay filled the air. It was awful. And not just that we felt like we're being watched. I feel like we're not the only ones in this forest, I said. My friends nodded, and we continued down the trail to get away from that smell. It lessened the more we got away from it until we couldn't smell it anymore. Then up ahead I saw the trail open up. It was a very gigantic open clearing with rows and rows of overgrown graves on one side and some on the other. It was like a horror movie. We didn't know there was a graveyard in the middle of nowhere. But one grave stood out from the rest. The dirt was pushed out, creating a crater in the ground like it was dug up. And not just that there was pieces of rotten coffin pushed up and scattered on the ground making us feel uneasy. We set up camp on the far side of the area under the shade of trees. We set up the chairs and fire. And just as I was about to light the fire, that smell came back and I saw him. A man in his twenties, seven two and a dark complexion started walking toward our camp, but his walking wasn't normally instead walking upright. He was staggering and his upper body was swinging side to side as he walked towards us. And I noticed his skin. It was at the beginning stage of decay with pieces of skin missing forming red patches, and he was skinny. His abdomen was sunken in. This was no Halloween costume, this was real. I also noticed the flies buzzing around him when he got closer. He stopped at the esky on the ground and pulled off the lid. He knocked it over, spilling the contents inside. A pack of meat fell out and he picked it up. His lipless mouth started to drool as he aggressively ripped off the plastic and pulled a thick slice of meat out with lipless mouth. He flicked his head back, flinging it into his mouth before grossly swallowing it whole. The lump slowly pushed down his skinny throat, disappearing out of sight at his chest. He staggered of the way he came out of sight. I thought we'll never have another encounter with this creature again, but I was very wrong. As night fell we huddled together inside the tent. Then we heard movement outside our tent. A deep herg sounded out. I knew it was that undead creature from before. He has returned for more food. Then he started to aggressively push against the tent. Run! I yelled. We exploded out of the tent and ran all the way back to the car. We drove all the way back home. I replaced all my camping gear the day after, but it costed me some money. I still camp with my friends, but we promised to never set foot in that forest ever again after that experience. The question that I'm asking myself is how many of those undead creatures are living in that forest? This story I am about to tell you has traumatized me and scared me for a few months, and I haven't really told anyone as I don't want them to freak out. Now for the story. It was April right before school got out, me and my good friend, let's call him Mark, were going to go on a camping trip in Arkansas and so me and him drove out, and at this time we were completely unaware what horrors we were about to face. We drove up into the campsite and set everything up. That night we had dinner, had a campfire, then we went to bed. We woke up shortly after surprised at first, not really knowing what was going on. Apparently the ground around us was flooding as well as our tent. Not hesitating, me and Mark rushed out into the rain and jumped in the car. I put my hand on my pocket, and then I remembered that I left my phone in the tent, so I rushed out to grab it. This made me more soaked and uncomfortable when the rain cleared up later that night. We were so uncomfortable, we packed up our stuff and drove away. We wanted to make something of this trip, so we rented a room at the Hot Springs Hotel. It was supposedly haunted, and there were some very strange things about this hotel as well as paranormal activity that we caught on camera, but that's a story for another time. After a while, we got bored and we wanted an adventure, so we decided to explore an abandoned nursing home that was a few miles outside the city. When Mark and I got to the home, we got out of our car with water bottles, headlamps, and a large pocket knife. Going into this nursing home was a huge mistake. I regret it to this day. Being the dumb kids we were, we walked in. This was trespassing, and we knew it. Everything was great at first. Mark and I walked around for a short while, and all was normal, or so we thought. There was spray paint and markings on the wall. 
which wasn't that big of a deal, but I said, we should go explore in the lower ground floor. Mark hesitated for a minute. I don't know, man, it's kind of creepy and dark, he said. I said he was just being a baby and told him to come. We walked slowly into the, the darkness and it was fine until, well, we saw a blue tarp in the distance we ran over to it and we were looked at it and we didn't think much of it, but we saw two holes about the size of apples in the table. I then noticed a dark red liquidy substance there too. Then I saw handcuffs. I let it sink in thinking about it and I screamed. I heard footsteps coming from above I us. There was no way in hell I was sticking around. I grabbed Mark by the hand, pulled him hard as we ran and jumped out of a ground-level window. We raced to the car and drove away. If you still don't know what I think happened, here's the problem with that. First, the red substance was definitely blood. I looked up the difference between real and fake blood. The person above us was most likely the cause of that blood, and the way I knew this was recent because the tarp was brand new and the blood wasn't dry. The holes I assumed were there to put the handcuffs through and cuff the victim to the table so he could not escape. The killer then proceeded to kill the man. The blood looked so fresh I would believe he was killed while we were there. I know this wasn't a prank because there wasn't anyone there to prank. If that person that was upstairs really was the killer, I can only imagine what he would have done to a couple of witnesses. To this day I will have never gone back to that city again. I thought we should call the police, but I didn't stupid enough. By the time I was going to, it was too late. The blood was probably cleaned up and someone had just gotten away with a murder. Here's a bit of background before we get started. This happened at a summer camp last year. I was with my four friends, Jackson, Joseph, and Carson. We were all really good friends and decided it'd be fun to attend a summer camp together. We all even got to share a cabin. This isn't the first time we've dealt with the paranormal. As a matter of fact, I've posted the story of when me, Joseph, and Carson encountered what we think was a werewolf or the dogman. Brody and Jackson weren't there, but they've both had strange encounters of their own. Anyways, let's get started. It all started when I had the idea of going into the woods and exploring. Everyone thought it would be fun. We were well aware of the rules of that camp, especially the one that says, stay with a group. The one we ignored was to stay on the trail. We all headed to the trail that led through the woods. As we walked, we were just playing with each other and talking until Jackson noticed something. Carson wasn't with us. We turned around and saw him about 45 feet behind us. He was just standing there looking into the woods. He said he saw something run past a tree, and he said he had the urge to follow it. Brody just said it was probably a deer and we all continued down the trail. We finally decided to leave the trail and enter the woods. We found some cool things. Joseph found a deer skull, Jackson found a cool rock, and I spotted a coyote a good distance from us. All in all, we had a good time. After a while, we actually found a river. We didn't have any fishing rods, but Joseph had brought some fishing line and hooks. We ended up making fishing rods from sticks and used worms as bait. I caught a rainbow trout and cooked it over a fire we had made. You'll understand why I'm telling you this soon. After we all ate, we decided head up river and explore. The trail was a straight line from the river, and we used the fire as a marker of some sort. We walked up river for a while without seeing anything. Just when I was about to say we should head back, Joseph spotted something. It was a cave about fifty yards away from us. It looked like fun, so we decided to enter. It was long and dark. Carson was using his flashlight, but it was already on low battery and soon died. We were left with total darkness. I could hardly make out everyone's silhouette. But something was wrong. There were five of us, so I should have seen four silhouettes. But I saw five. I just kept looking to make sure I wasn't seeing things. But I soon realized we weren't alone in that cave. This other silhouette was nearly eight feet tall. It definitely wasn't human. I almost jumped when I came to this realization. But I tried my hardest to remain calm. I leaned in towards my friends and whispered, Look over in that corner. We're not alone. We have to leave now. We all tried to remain calm. We casually walked out of the cave. We knew this thing hadn't attacked us yet. We thought if we ran it might chase us. But as soon as we got to the entrance I looked back. This creature was now standing in the middle of the cave. It had moved while we weren't looking. That's when we all ran out of there. We were running for our lives. 
We ran all the way back to the fire and put it out abnormally fast. Then we turned towards retrail and booked it. We were getting cuts and scrapes from the thick walls of bushes and trees. We didn't care, though. I even saw Joseph run straight through a huge bush. We just knew we had to get out of there fast. We didn't even stop when we got on the trail. We ran all the way back to the camp. It took us quite a while Roe calmed down after that. When it was our curfew, we all made our way to our cabin. We all enjoyed staying up late, so that's what we did. At some point, Joseph got up to use the bathroom. Before he even closed the bathroom door, we heard him yell. He came running out of there terrified. We weren't even that scared until we saw his face. Brody asked what happened, and Joseph told us there was a face and hands up against the window. I know what you're thinking. Why would there be a window in the bathroom, right? Well, this window was seven feet off the ground, so no one could see in it. But this creature had no trouble. Joseph said it had the head of a goat and human hands, but its fingers were long and ended in long, sharp claws. He said altogether this thing was massive and covered in gray fur. This sent chills down our spines. I immediately thought of the goat man. That's when we heard banging coming from outside our wall. It was shaking the entire cabin. I was on the top bunk of one of our bunk beds, and I actually fell off when we heard it. We were all cowering like scared puppies in that cabin. In a split second, the banging was coming from the door and not the wall. We were all horrified. How could something move that fast? Then something terrifying happened, something that still haunts me to this day. The banging stopped and we heard my voice coming from outside, but it was evil and demonic. It said in my voice, Look over there in that corner. We're not alone. We have to leave now. It didn't make any sense. It was as if it was just repeating what it had heard and didn't actually understand what it was saying. After a few seconds of silence, the banging continued now louder than ever. I honestly thought we were going to die that night. Just then it stopped. Everything was quiet. We didn't dare move. We were all still freaking out. We never slept that night. We just sat in silence until sunrise. Jackson finally said something. He said, What on earth was that? I replied, I think we just met the goat man. We never saw him again and were fine for the rest of the time we were there. I will never go back to that summer camp. Summer camps can be a lot of fun, but some of them, the ones in the woods, might be a very dangerous place. There are things out there lurking in the woods, things that will have no trouble catching you if you let your guard down. If you're ever at a Sumner camp in the woods, follow the rules. They might just save your life. LQS 6. That particular year, as summer drew near, my mom sent me away to camp so I wouldn't be a bother. I wasn't a stranger to this camp either. I had been going to it for the past four years, but as an older kid, I had to prepare myself mentally. This was an horse camp, so I knew all the young kids, which were the majority, would be screaming for the prettiest pony. So to give you a feel of the camp, let me just say that this camp was old, old as bones. The lodges we stayed at were made of wood with tarps as roofs and cots as beds. I got paired up with two little girls we can call Lizzie and Callie, and an older girl I knew very well who we can call Rose. As a little detail, before I went to bed, I visited my horse whose name was Bonzi. Bonzi was a white Arabian. I remember brushing Bonzi completely alone in the barn because no one else wanted to go with me, ironically. I heard the clatter of what sounded like a brush falling. So I put my own brush down and went out of the stalls to see what fell. Nothing. I shrugged it off, and as soon as I entered the stalls, I looked up to see Bonzi completely whizzing out. She was crying and trying to escape with a deadly look of fear in her eyes. I managed to calm her and every other horse down and booked it back to my lodge. As the day drew to a close, I sat on the porch of our lodge as the sun faded, and I knew something was wrong, and not just what had happened with Bonzi either. I had always felt at home in these woods, but I felt so tense these weren't the same woods. Third day. The anxious feeling hadn't gone away. At the end of writing lessons I swear I saw something vanish into the woods. I had turned my head to see what it was and found a giant bonzy horsefoot slamming right onto mine. I was forced to skip out on some activities, but nothing else happened for the rest of the day. Night of the fifth day. It must have been around one or two in the morning I had been woken up by Lizzie and Callie needing a light for the way back. I told them I'd sit on the deck with my flashlight on, 
As I sat there, I felt a chill creep up my spine. Hello? Stupid question to ask. Then I heard rustling. I spun around and stared at the end of my cabin, and as every person fears, a head popped out and I shrilled. It had no skin. It was just a black figure and sunken white eyes. I dropped my light and ran inside, knowing it was running after me by the sound of wood being slammed. The door rattled and shook. I wanted to scream no, but all I did was hold it shut, too scared of what it would do to me or Rose if it got in, when all of a sudden through my tears and racing heart I heard, Moon, open the door. It was Lizzie and Callie. I swung open the door and pulled them inside. There a man outside. My heart sank. Did he hurt you? No, why are you so scared? Because I saw him too. For the rest of the night, me, Lizzie, and Callie slept in the same bed. Nothing else happened until the last night where cabins were split up in a game of glow in the dark tag. We had tried to forget what had happened the previous night and hid in the barn. Big mistake. Me and Lizzie had been hiding for a while, sitting up next to the hay bales silently talking when we heard a scuffle. We smiled, thinking it was one of the campers, and looked over the ledge to see who. Our hearts sank. A tall, lengthy black figure stood in the middle of the barn. It was hunched over with long claws. I slammed my hand over Lizzie's mouth and backed away into the hay. I could feel both our hearts racing as we sat waiting for what seemed like hours. When I saw its eyes, the ledge we were hiding on was Atlas, six feet in the air. It stared, looking around at the hay, making grunts before it vanished. I grabbed Lizzie and dashed out of the barn running. As I exited, I felt its claws raked my shoulder, but I kept running. I just wanted to live. I never saw it again, and a message to the creature, let's not meet again, please. This happened to me and my cousins around a decade ago when I was 16 and my cousins were 13 and 10. We'll call them Bill and Ramon. We had gone on a camping trip with their dad, who I'll refer to as Roger, to the Appalachian wilderness and engaged in your average camping activities, like fishing, hiking, and sitting around campfires to tell ghost stories before turning in for the night. We had initially planned to stay out for longer than a week, which in the beginning was a very pleasant experience, marked by warm, sunny weather and breezy, starlit summer nights. However, around the fourth day, things started to take a turn for the strange and downright terrifying. It was in the evening, and we were sitting around the fire, talking and laughing loudly just your typical tumultuous adolescence. We roasted marshmallows while Roger was making dinner when I decided to get a picture of myself standing in front of the dark woods holding a large brook trout that I had caught earlier that day. This detail will be important later. Around 11 p.m., the radio that had been playing suddenly began to falter into static, causing Bill to smack it repeatedly in a misguided attempt to get it back to work, which it didn't. An eerie silence overtook the campsite only occasionally broken by the periodic crackling of the fire. Even the nocturnal choir of frogs and crickets had been completely extinguished, along with our own racket. I remember the tense feeling of being watched as shivers ran down my arms and spine. Ramon, being the youngest, held on to his father who tried to break the unsettling silence with an inappropriately cheerful, Let's eat. We turned in soon after eating, though it was distinctly hard to sleep with the deafening silence and the persistent feeling of being watched still hanging over me. The next day started off well enough. Birds were chirping and the fresh morning breeze was gently swaying the leaves around us. We had breakfast and headed out for our planned hike. I was feeling much better than the night before and had set out looking forward to the woodland adventure. It was late in the afternoon when we finally stopped to eat lunch in a clearing, surrounded by the forest and its sounds. As we were eating, though, I felt goosebumps along my back and arms, just like last night, and the feeling of being watched overtook me. From the looks of it, Roger and my cousins were also overcome with an uneasy feeling. As if synchronized with our discomfort, the birds also halted their singing as silence befell our hike. Tense and tired, we decided to make our way back. The entire time, the dreadful feeling of being observed only growing as we approached the lake. Making our way down the hiking path and reaching the bank of the lake, we stopped when we heard a rustle in the distance. Roger held his hand up as if to motion us to stop and be quiet while he nervously scanned the vicinity. Again we heard a rustle, only this time much more vigorous and seemingly closer, 
as if something were stalking us from within the tall grass nearby. Roger, who was holding a gun, was now on full alert, as he was expecting a black bear. His stance and seriousness frightened me, as my cousins and I huddled together near Roger. We stood there for what seemed like an eternity until, finally, Roger decided the coast was clear. I had spent another restless night, haunted by silence. The following day, however, was the most fun I had the whole trip. In the morning we had gone fishing out in the lake and I caught another large fish, and after we spent the rest of the day swimming until late in the afternoon. We had arrived at the campsite around dusk as I specifically remember the dramatic hues of orange and yellow that painted the sky in resplendent watercolor. Crickets and frogs were resonating their characteristic serenades as we approached, coming back from a day of fishing and swimming. We were laughing and stumbling as we carried our fishing gear down the trail, with Roger leading the way. Before we stepped into the campsite, Roger stopped dead in his tracks, causing me and my cousins to crash into him and each other, though he, a gargantuan man, didn't even seem to flinch. We looked at each other, baffled, and then we peeked out from behind him to find something which caused my legs to tremble in fear. There, right in the very center of our campsite, erected over the ashes of our long extinguished campfire, was what I could only describe as the second most horrifying sight of my life, a grotesque effigy, apparently made of thousands of small twigs that had been banded together to form a torso and four limbs. At the end of both arms, twisted branched had been contrived into hands, and perched atop the torso was a large deer skull, which was seemingly smeared or painted with strange crimson-colored symbols. From its large, menacing antlers hung several small wooden trinkets fashioned into symbols which looked like the ones painted on the skull. After soaking in the dire situation, Roger snapped into action and gripped his gun, which had been swung over his shoulder. Like a drill sergeant, he ordered Bill and me to pack as much as we could as fast as we could while he started the truck, instructing us to leave anything heavy, including the tents. I had never moved so fast in my life. We left nearly everything non-essential as we haphazardly threw our belongings in the truck. Meanwhile, Roger was standing watch, gun ready, as Ramon was crying in the car. Shortly after, we sped away down the dirt path, surrounded by the soundless woods. A few days after arriving home, I had remembered about that photo I took with the brook I caught fishing. I wish I had never remembered about that photo. After downloading the pictures from my digital camera, I found the photo I was looking for. There I was, cheerfully holding my catch, illuminated by the warm light from the campfire. But something behind me had caught my eye, something I had missed while looking in the camera's screen. Hidden in the gloom of the dark forest was a faint glimpse of a partially illuminated head. After increasing the brightness on the image, I almost fell backward in pure terror. Right there, looking at me, was what appeared to be a menacing human-like face with ghostly white skin dark, sunken eyes, a flared nose, and what appeared to be antlers protruding from both sides of its bald head. If the effigy it had left on our camp was the second most horrifying thing I've ever seen, this nightmarish photo would certainly take the first spot. One thing's for sure. I will never go camping like that again. So this story started when my cousin, I'll call him Mick, called my sister to ask her if she would give him a ride to a campsite in Nogal. He asked her if she wanted to go, and she said yes, but she asked him if I could go too, and he said that I could go too. Now I was happy because I never went camping in my life. His sons were coming too. They'll be Nick and Barry. My sister has a truck with a big bed, so me, Nick, and Barry sat in the back on the way over there. When we got there, we started putting up the tents. The thing is, we got the at 532, and it gets dark here at about 6 o'clock. So by the time we got them up and got wood for the fire, it was dark. After a bit of talking, me and Nick decided to sit in the bed of the truck and talk there. Barry joined us a little after. After a little of talking, Mick and my sister Shay went to go get wood for the fire. We offered to help, but they said no that we were having too much fun and they didn't want to ruin it. We were talking when were herd branches being moved in the woods. We thought it was my sister and Mick moving, but then we noticed that the flashlight they had was on the opposite side of us, and us being dumb teens said, Let's go see what it is. I wish I never said that. We got our flashlights and went towards it. 
and into the woods we were looking around for a while when then I saw that my that everyone was gone. I was going to yell for them, but before I could, I heard Nick scream. I mean, he screamed at the top of his lungs. I ran towards him, and when I got there, I was horrified. There was something clamped on his shoulder. It was some creature pale white with no eyes but some sort of mouth with a triangular-shaped mouth, tall, and I mean tall. It was maybe eight feet tall because Nick was six foot, and it towered him. It had blade-like bones for hands that were wrapped around him. I shined my light at it, and it let go like it had eyes that the light blinded, but I know it didn't, and Nick ran towards me, and the creature made a blood-curdling scream. It sounded like a woman with a mix of lion roar, then a gunshot. We saw blood coming from it, chest with a bullet hole. Then I turned and we saw Mick with a rifle. Was relieved, but then that turned back into fright as I looked and saw that the bullet shot was gone, and it was looking at Nick. It ran at light speed towards him, and I mean so fast that he was twenty yards away, and it was face to face with him I a split second, and without a thought he shot again, and it backed off and made that scream again and ran off. I didn't know how scared I was until I noticed that I was shacking and couldn't move and sitting on the floor. I got up and we all ran towards the truck and left everything there and drove as fast as we could out of the campsite. After we got out I noticed that Barry wasn't there. I asked where is he and they both looked at me with a depressed look and told me they found it. Body literally had the blood sucked out of him and that is what it was doing to Nick. We took him to the hospital because he had lots of blood gone. When they asked what happened they lied to them and I don't blame them. No one would believe them. Then they called the cops and told them where was, and the next day we were told about Barry and all of that. All I tell you is to not go out to Nogal, New Mexico at night. I'm shaking will typing this, and sad for my cousin just feel your blood get drained out of you, but that at my story. This happened about eight to ten years ago. This story is absolutely true, and you will absolutely not believe any of it, and I have absolutely no way of proving any of it. That doesn't really matter to me, though. I just wanted to tell one of my stories. Some friends and I decided to go camping. We set up just inside the tree line in a clearing. There was a small beach shoreline leading out to the bay, just feet away from our camp. The girl I was with, I'll call her Amy, her family owned the land. Amy is just wonderful, you know, beautiful inside and out, the kind of person who can thaw a cold heart and light up a room. The place we were at was amazing. It was warm for swimming during the day and perfectly cool at night. The sunsets were breathtaking as they are here. We had great friends coming in and out of camp each day. It was nearly perfect. Whenever Amy and I got together like this, it just seemed like the world was filled with magic. I'm not just saying the feelings we had were magical. I'm saying when the two of us came together, it seemed as if the whole universe would just line up directly for us. Have you ever in your entire life found it necessary to give an explanation similar to this? Amy, I don't know how many times I have to say it. I'm not magic. I'm not able to call dragonflies or any other wildlife at will. I promise you I have no control over plants, and sadly I'm unable to cause flowers to bloom. Beautiful, seemingly magical things would happen around us and happen to us all the time. She and I were watching the sunset. When the sun was almost out of view completely, I noticed the ground around us had changed beautifully. We had been surrounded by evening primrose and night-blooming jasmine. As the amazingly breathtaking colorful light show faded from the sky, a new, beautifully breathtaking colorful show had come into full bloom all around us. It was a truly magical night, surrounded by hundreds of multicolored flowers. Earlier that day, Amy and I even won a bunch of food when we went shopping. The store was celebrating something and raffling prizes. We won every raffle that we signed up for. We had been low on money, food, and beer for our guest. Total providence. For me, all was well and everything was right in my world. Even the dragonflies and butterflies were blessing our trip by repeatedly landing on us. It was amazing. On the third day we were there, a weird oily slick had formed over the water. It felt like something had changed. We probably should have left then. I knew at the very least we should have stayed out of the water, but I was powerless against Amy in her bikini. And yes, of course, I went swimming with her. Later that afternoon, two strangers wander into our camp. This is private property and not easy to find. I'm very wary of the two strangers, but my friends are all a few beers this side of fuck ye. These two nefarious-looking fuckers get invited to hang out, 
by my very gracious inebriated friends. I think they stayed for one beer then left. This was very suspicious to me. Why would they leave? What was the only fun thing happening in the area? Later, things wind down. Amy and I retire to her tent for the night. Some hours later, I wake to the sound of things being moved around, a bag being opened and dumped. I think I can hear whispers, but not certain. I was certain that something was very wrong. Amy woke up and looked at me. I motioned for her to stay silent. I unzipped the tent and stepped out, leaving my right hand inside. About fifteen feet away from me are the two nefarious fuckers from before, rifling through our things. I break the silence by saying, If you're going to rob a campsite, you should really steal the axe first. It will make the campers easier to control if we wake up while you're robbing us. As I was saying this, I was pointing with my left hand to my axe. It was about fifteen feet away from me, around six feet from them. The obvious leader starts towards me. I take three steps out towards him and following with me was nearly four feet of mirror-polished steel. I had a cold steel Bagua sword in my right hand. It's a two-handed Chinese broadsword. He stopped and looked back at my axe. I said to him, I promise, I will let you get your hand on the axe. The two of us stared at each other for a while, then his friend started freaking out. Come on, man, let's get out of here. The guy turned around and they both took off. It was so funny watching them run away. They kept looking back to see if I was chasing them, and honestly, I wanted to. I decided on a better option and went back into Amy's tent. She wrapped her arms around me. She said something like, It's okay, you're okay. It's a strange, somewhat cold, but also kind of comforting feeling. The feeling you get when you realize that you are the most terrifying monster in the woods. Now for maybe the weirdest part of this trip. Amy and I got woken up again later that same night. We again hear things moving around outside. I decided I was just going to rush them this time without giving any warning. If it was the same people out there, they most likely had violence in mind. Why else would they come back, except to get revenge on a man half their size who humiliated them? Amy and I stayed silent. I was going to go out the window on the other side of the tent to surprise them. Just as I was about to leave the tent, I hear my name being called from outside near the window. Yes, the very window I was about to crawl out of. This was wrong on so many levels. I do not think the crybaby pirating party crashers knew my name. If they did, they would have most likely called me Matt, like most people do. Was it maybe one of my friends? That would have been the most likely possibility, though something just didn't feel right. The night started seeming too dark and the silence was absolute. We could no longer even hear the water from the bay rolling back and forth. The wrongness of this situation was overbearing. It's difficult to explain the strangeness of what we felt. The atmosphere was just thick, with wrong. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. Even closer than before, we hear my name called out three more times. Each time my name was spoken with elevating aggression and a kind of manic joy. More than the deepening darkness and worse than the lack of any normal sounds from the wilderness. Amy and I realize what the main cause of the thick, oppressive wrong is. It's my voice. Something is standing just outside the tent, inches away from us, and it is calling out to me, using my voice. The aggressive manic joy it speaks with makes it sound like it just can't wait to murder my face off and definitely eat it, and likely other things that I don't want to think about. I am very lucky that Amy was with me that night. I think her being there saved all our lives. I have an awesome fear response. When someone I care about is in danger, I just get furious. I grabbed my handy-dandy deadly sword and I started to move towards the main entrance. Then Amy grabbed my arm hard and said something to the effect of absolutely not. Yep, my plan was to sword fight a supernatural something that had the abilities to deaden sound plunge its surroundings into absolute darkness, and perfectly mimic people's voices. Who knows what else it was capable of, or even what it was. I instead yelled out in a fearless, unwavering voice, If I have to step outside of this tent tonight, one of us is going to die. We sat there together in silence for what felt like hours, though it was probably just a few minutes. Then Amy, being all badass and amazing like she is, faces towards the window flap, and towards where the I'm a eat face mimic voice came from, and she said with conviction, 
I really do not want you to have to die tonight. You should leave. At that moment, hearing her say that, I felt like I had just taken a motorized surfboard down a whitewater rapid while performing magic carpet ride by Steppenwolf and lovingly cradling a honey badger that I was rescuing from the tornado we were currently outrunning. Sorry, that kind of got away from me. The implications of that one sentence and her actions just astounded me. She had no fear and complete faith in me. This thing, whatever it was, she truly believed that I could take it. I just sat there in awe. She was staring at the window flap with a look of calm confidence on her face. At that moment, it didn't matter what that thing outside the tent was or what it was capable of. No matter what, it was decided. With her courage and faith in me, if that thing decided to attack, it would die. We waited there like that, just listening. My voice never did end up calling me again from outside the tent. Soon it was like nothing happened. The sound and ambient light came back, and it was over. Amy looked over at me, and she smiled her dazzling smile, and then said to me, I think it's safe now. I said, I believe you are right. I turned in towards Amy and went back to sleep. Something did kind of freak me out later, though, after I thought about it. I never did hear any footsteps walking away, but maybe the thing left while the sound was still all weird and muted. I don't know. I forgot to explain the weird oily slick on the water. So, the day I get back from the camping trip, my dad tells me the most disturbing part of the whole thing. My dad. Did you hear about water treatment plant? Me. No, what happened? My dad. A raw sewage main busted. It's been spilling out into the bay for a few days now. Me. You knew I was out camping by the bay. Why the hell didn't you call me? My dad. Sorry I didn't hear about it until today. The conversation went on a while longer like that, but there was no consolation to be had. Elmin, what can you really say to someone who's just found out that they've been swimming in raw sewage and human waste for three days? I live in Australia, and my school was pretty big on camps and such. They had taken us to some camping grounds at the base of a mountain. When we arrived, there was no one else there. We set up our tents and found the toilet block up a driveway. The first night something strange happened. I struggled to fall asleep after I woke up for no apparent reason. And that's when I heard it. Heavy breathing right outside the tent. Right next to my head I looked over to my best friend. She was also in the tent. She was fast asleep, her mouth closed. I knew the breathing wasn't coming from her. I'd been awake for at least thirty minutes before I heard the breathing. The tents made quite a bit of noise when they were unzipped, yet I heard no tent open. Whatever was outside wasn't in my class. I was paralyzed, lying there praying it would leave. I was terrified that it would open the tent and take me and best friend. But after what seemed like forever it disappeared, the breathing fading away. I told all my friends what happened, but they all said the breathing was coming from my best friend. They didn't believe me. The next night my friend needed to pee. We were both very tall for twelve-year-old old girls, and I was surprisingly strong despite doing no sports. I didn't want to leave the tent, but it was around four-ish in the morning and there was a bit of light out. So me and my friend leave the tent when we see one massive footprint followed by a tiny one. Whoever made those footprints had a large and small foot, and they were the only footprints on the dewy grass. My friend tried to ignore the weirdness of the situation, claiming it was probably one of the guys playing a prank. I pointed out that there was no return footprints, so how did the guys get back to the tent? She ignored me and started walking up the dirt driveway. And then we hear a ear-piercing shriek. We were both on edge. But we continued up the driveway. We turn a corner as the driveway is very windy. We found what caused the shriek. Three dead possums in a line, all freshly killed, blood seeping out of their necks. My best friend turns me, asking if I think a dingo did that. I shook my head. There's no dingoes around here. If there was, there would be a warning at the entrance of the camping grounds. My friend was panicking now. Then what did that? She asked. I don't know. I still don't know. We made it to the bathrooms, and as we started to walk back, we bumped into a woman, probably in her thirties. She smiled at us and walked into the bathroom. As we were walking back, I realized I don't know where she came from. The only people at the camping grounds were from our school. No new tents or caravans were in the open space. The grounds weren't that big, surrounded by mountains, creeks, and national parks. I would have seen her tent or caravan, but there was nothing new. 
To this day, I've never told anyone about the woman or the possums. There were many different creepy things that occurred around my little brother. Let's call him Time, a nickname he has. Let's start off by first stating our mother is a very cruel and evil woman. I don't want to get too into it, but if you have read or heard about a book called A Child Called It, then that pretty much shows how she treated us. She had eight kids, but for some reason only treated Time and myself like garbage. Probably because we share the same dad while the others have a different dad. Anyway, at a very early age, time would panic every time the sun started going down. We used to have to stay in the unfinished garage, no windows, no AC, no heat. We shared a bunk bed with very shitty mattresses. Time is four years younger than myself, and like I stated, he was terrified of the dark. One night my mother had locked us in the garage for the next three or four days. She was upset because I stole food from the kitchen to feed Time and myself, since she didn't allow us to eat with the rest of the family. I stole those zebra cake snack cakes. She hadn't fed us in a couple days and we were so hungry. We normally had a bucket to use the bathroom in and a gallon jug of water and that was it. Anyway, I heard Time sniffling as Mom locked the door. I jumped down from the top bunk to look at him. Are you okay? It's only for a couple days. I'm sorry I shouldn't have taken those snack cakes, I said softly. He just shook his head. He didn't really talk much. Mostly he spoke in broken sign language. He made the sign for Cookie, which threw me off, but I hopped up into my bunk and grabbed the two Oreos I had for him every night. I stole a pack a while back and they were getting stale, but I always made sure he had them. I handed them to him and he smiled. He always took his time eating them. I went to hop back into bed, but I noticed him staring at the garage door. What is it? I asked. His eyes widened and he shook his head. No, he whimpered. Then he made the sign for Scared. I hugged him. I won't let Mom hurt you. I promised. I always made sure to make her more mad so she didn't hurt him. No, he said and made the sign for Monster. I blinked a few times and said, There's no monsters, remember? Yoshi cleared them all out. Time loved Yoshi from the Mario games. So, every time he got scared I said Yoshi would protect him. It worked for almost everything. Just then something smacked hard against the garage door, making us both jump. No, yelled Time. It's back. It was probably just a bird. Birds get confused when it gets dark out. I said. It did happen often. Normally it was the window in the living room, but they could easily hit the garage door as well. Time shook his head. It comes at night. Every night. I was starting to get scared myself. What was he talking about? I laid down on the floor next to his bunk. Okay, I'll sleep right here so nothing can get you. I said. He threw a pillow down to me, which brought a smile to my face. We were always there for each other. I reached over and turned off the dying lamp that sat on the floor. It barely had light to it, but it was better than nothing. Pretty soon I could hear Time whimper again. I grabbed the emergency flashlight I kept under his bunk and turned it on. It was dim normally, but if I clicked it twice, it had a bright strip of light down the side to light up the whole garage. I sat it on the floor sitting up so the whole room glowed. A shiver ran down my spine. Why is it so cold tonight? It's July, I asked, pulling my quilt down from the top bunk. I glanced at Time, who was focused on the far corner of the garage. What is it? But I was cut off by a loud boom, within seconds after Mom hit the door that went into the house. Quiet down in there, was basically what she said. Now I was frightened. No way was that a bird, and now I know it wasn't Mom. Hungry, Time said, sitting straight up in his bunk. I know, buddy, I'll get us some food once Mom takes her sleepy meds. No, he's hungry. This stopped me dead. Woohoo! was all that came out. Time stared at the garage door. He wants in, this panicked me. Never had I felt so scared. I hopped up and shone the light over to the garage. Nothing was in the room with us, but I could see something moving around by the crack of the door. The boom. It tried to open the door. That's why I could see out of it now. The metal lock had stopped it, but the door was old. The lock was old. This didn't look good. It was probably a homeless guy trying to get in. I looked back at my little brother and put my finger to my lips. He nodded in understanding. I pulled the little pocket knife my dad had given me out. 
If he stuck his fingers through the door crack, I'd cut him. My heart was punting in my ears, but I knew if I told Mom, she would punish us worse and call us liars. I really didn't even think about telling her at the time. I heard this weird screeching noise as I edged closer to the door. A lump stuck in my throat. What made a sound like that? A raccoon? This thought made me feel a little better, but something in my gut said whatever was on the other side was dangerous. I looked over to the lock and noticed a roll of duct tape next to it. That might help. I quickly and quietly pulled a piece. It was way louder than I expected. I froze as I heard whatever was on the other side run slash hop to the other side of the door. Did I scare it? I ripped it off and stuck it around the lock. I'm not sure if it would help at all, but I did feel a little better. Then what sounded like nails on a chalkboard rang out. It lasted for what felt like forever, but really was less than a minute. Time squeaked but buried his head in his blanket to stifle it. I ran back to my brother and hopped into his bunk with him. What was that? I said as soft as I could. Time grabbed the flashlight and turned it off. Monster, he said. Why'd you turn the light off? I asked, a bit alarmed. He shrugged. He don't like it, he said. Then he signed, angry. I didn't know what to think. How do you know that? I asked. He didn't answer for a while, but soon he said, talks to me every night. This really freaked me out. What does he say? Time fumbled with the flashlight. Wants in, he finally said. Then he pointed to himself. At first I thought he meant inside the garage, but then it hit me. Is, is it a demon or ghost? I asked, my body shaking all over. He shrugged and said, Monster, a monster wanted my brother. These words echoed through my head. Curiosity took a hold of me. Have you seen it? What does it look like? He turned the flashlight on dim so I could see him better and signed scary, tall, nasty. We really didn't know sign language entirely, so a lot of what he signed was broken. There was no way this was happening. Bang, bang, it hit the garage again. I was hoping Mom had taken her sleep meds and passed out already, or we would be in bigger trouble if we survived this. Time grabbed my arm and I looked back at him. He whimpered, in, monster trying. I didn't know what to do, so we just sat there hoping it wouldn't get in. I must have passed out because when I opened my eyes, light was starting to poke in through the garage door. Time was still asleep. I softly got out of the bed and went to the door to the house. I used my pocket knife to slip the lock open and peeked out. It was still very early. Everyone was still asleep and our stepdad must already be at work. I crept out and went straight for the front door first. I held my breath as I slowly opened the door and peered out. Nothing was there. I closed the door behind me as I walked over to the garage. There were a bunch of dents in the door and now I knew why. Tears ran down my face. It was real. That wasn't even the worst of it. On the ground next to the door were huge footprints. It looked like dinosaur footprints. I couldn't believe it. Four toed, giant dinosaur footprints. What was I looking at? I had never seen anything like it. I remembered from Jurassic Park how the T-Rex's prints were and these were very similar. Not exact, but it was the closest I could think of. There was no way a dinosaur just tried to get into our garage, though, right? I shook the idea from my head. This wasn't possible. The strange sounds it made, how it talked to time, this was something way strange. I quickly went back inside and into the kitchen, stealing food that wouldn't be missed like I always had to do. I would take baggies and fill them with cereal, cookies, or whatever was open that wouldn't be noticeable. Then I ran back to the garage. Putting the lock back was the trickier part, but within minutes I had got it. I woke time up and gave him some food. He smiled and ate happily. After a few minutes he asked, Monster gone? I nodded. Yes, it went away. How many times has it been here? I asked. All those dents were not from last night. There was no way. He paused a moment, swallowed his food, and held up his hand showing me five fingers. Five times? In a row or... He held up three fingers. Last night makes three in a row. A shiver ran down my spine again. What was this thing and why does it want my brother? Work as a generator mechanic in a rural part of California, deep in the Sierras at the edge of the Tahoe Forest. People tend to think of California as all beaches and Hollywood, but the reality is that it's just two major cities surrounded by thousands of miles of rural countryside. With wildfire and severe snowstorms being a regular occurrence, 
generators are a big part of life around here, and my work revolves around keeping those machines running, which often requires being on call during emergencies. Last winter a massive storm was hammering the Sierras for days on end, and the calls were steadily coming in, a variety of typically expected equipment failures and the usual ridiculous questions. But this wasn't a typical snowstorm. Most locals described the heavy snowfall and high winds as something they had not seen in these mountains in over 40 years. My company only employs a small crew of technicians and electricians, but our trucks are outfitted to respond under all kinds of conditions, as our services are often required when the weather is particularly nasty. Even with the proper gear and vehicles, we were all having to spend tremendous effort just to stay on the road, assuming we could even see them. Falling trees became background noise, punctuating the roaring wind with the occasional thunderclap of breaking wood, followed shortly by the heavy thud that could be felt even through our frozen work boots. The whole crew had met in the shop that morning to attend what had become daily emergency meetings. The usual topics were covered while we refueled chainsaws, loaded portable generators, and prepared for another day battling the elements to get as many people's power back online as we could or at least able to run their home generators until power could be restored. Large maps of the surrounding areas had been hastily hung on the walls to keep track of which roads were completely blocked, where the power crews had been, and where they were going to be working next, along with locations of emergency stations for fuel, medical aid, and warming shelters. I was studying the maps while changing out a worn chain on my saw, making notes on some of the new emergency frequencies we, we would be using to communicate during the crisis, as cell phone coverage had gone from spotty to nearly non-existent during the storm, forcing us to rely on the radios mounted in the trucks. And remember, called out the boss man as we prepared to leave for the day, always check all the way around a downed tree before moving anything from your path to reach a client's home. We don't need another incident like Tuesday. Good luck. Stay safe. Our community needs you all to be able to come back to work. He was referring to an incident a few days ago when a tech had tried to move a large fallen tree from across the road and had apparently been electrocuted when he hooked his winch to a tree, which had been lying on top of a live power line. He only survived because the fall alarm on our radio sends out a distress signal whenever they are laid on their side for more than a few minutes. Rescue crews found him lying in the snow by his truck, both he and the vehicle had sustained extensive burns. He survived, but was still in the ICU. Due to his combination injuries of both frostbite and burns, he had been put under heavy sedation for the time being, but was expected to pull through. So lucky me, today I was going to be working the calls in his area. I pulled on my snow cap with a built-in LED headlamp that my wife had bought me, pulled my heavy coat tight around my body, and climbed into the cab of my truck. Already warmed up, I dropped into four wheels and started what I thought would be just another day at the office. The day went by as the last few had. On a normal shift, the work could be trying for a number of different reasons. Mechanical issues, poor placement of generators, outdated equipment installed improperly, and just plain bad luck. But the most difficult part of the job can often be the customers. The usual whiners, complainers, and know-it-alls were bad enough on a good day but conditions like this made them all exponentially worse. I'm not without sympathy. Lots of people all over the area were suffering and needed help, but some were merely inconvenienced, yet acted as though this storm and our scheduling were some kind of personal attack on their ability to watch Netflix, post selfies on Instagram, or browse Etsy for another glow-in-the-dark birdbath or whatever other stuff they don't need. They couldn't get anything delivered to them right now anyway. Thankfully, those types tend to be a rare occurrence, mostly made up of Bay Area transplants that just aren't used to living in the mountains where things like this are just part of life. Eight hours flew past as I went about my calls. Pretty common issues, a tight valve here and bad mixer there, some electrical troubleshooting. Most everyone I could get to was unbelievably grateful, offering tip money, bottles of wine, and even a steak from a cattle rancher that I happily accepted despite our company policy to not accept tips. But hey, these were extenuating circumstances, and some folks just won't take sorry it's against policy for an answer. 
Plus, I am not one to shy away from a good steak, policy, or no. I had just finished up my last call and had begun my staging part of the day. Staging is when all the scheduled calls are done. We have a minute before the emergency calls can be routed to our devices. I will say that I do work for a great company that has some pretty amazing staff. The people who work in the office are fantastic about studying our location and routing us along the most efficient route possible, as well as prioritizing which jobs need to come first, and talking to the customers, walking them through fixing certain issues themselves so those of us in the field don't waste time helping people that could easily fix the issue without us. I drive until I find an area with decent cell service and wait. It's actually kind of pleasant. While the conditions outside are miserable, I enjoy the minute to myself to sit in my truck, heater on full blast. Thanks to my ingenious wife who bought me a small lunch container with an accessory that plugs into the truck, I can sit and enjoy some hot food for the first time after eight hours in the elements. As anyone in this line of work can tell you, there is a certain joy that comes from working in a crisis. I'm in my late thirties now, but in my twenties I spent a few years working as an emergency medical technician. I left that job because having a front row seat to the endless parade of human suffering was doing my mental health no favors, but I still get nostalgic about the rush of adrenaline that comes with that type of work. Being out in a storm like this helped to scratch that itch from time to time, and despite being cold, tired, and overall soaking wet from sweating while in the middle of Snowmageddon, I was at least happy with my work and slept a lot better than I used to. The interior of the truck is busy looking, crammed full of all the additional accessories we carry around while working emergencies. Cell phone chargers and battery banks plugged into charging ports, radios, and docking stations across the dash. A pile of defective or broken parts fill the passenger seat, accompanying the daunting pile of service manuals, tools bags, and field equipment. I crack a window as I finish lunch and dinner and light a cigarette as I watch the loading bar on my laptop get to almost full, bringing in the latest set of emergency calls. The pinwheel finally moves again, and a new set is uploaded as the last of the dim light of day fades away. I look at the clock on my phone. It's only 500 p.m., three more calls. I take a deep breath and sigh heavily, a 12-hour day again. Well, at least I'm making good overtime. The next call is a no start on a home generator, and from the notes it sounds like an easy one, probably just a lack of maintenance. I run through the usual suspects out of there in no time. I mentally slap myself for even thinking that, because while I'm not a believer in much in the way of superstition, I am firm in my confidence that Murphy's Law is very, very real. Anything that can go wrong will. In my experience, at the end of the day, a plan is just a list of things that didn't happen. I laugh out loud to myself, then stop to touch the pendant I wear around my neck. St. Jude, the patron saint of lost causes and desperate situations. I say to myself, oh well, here we go, and start driving to the next job site. The location of this next site is pretty remote, even for these parts. As I make my way around the winding narrow road, I slowly pass the spot where our injured mechanic had his accident. I'm not a particularly religious or spiritual person. But Catholicism has a way of permeating, so I cross myself and send a good thought out to the poor guy and his family, hoping whatever powers that be are looking after him, or at least taking some mercy upon him. I mean, geez, the guy was only doing his job, no different than the rest of us. I arrived at the house, which honestly I can't really make out. The level of snow was obscuring the common details I would use to prejudge the situation I'm stepping into. Are they older folks in this their vacation home? Are they locals who have lived here for decades and finally had to call a repairman because they exhausted all of their own attempts to fix the problem? Whatever the case, I threw on my hat with the company logo, donned my shining reflective safety vest, and trudged my way to the front door. The couple that answered the door were obviously in their later years but seemed homely and sweet. The husband explained how he had tried everything he could think of to use his phrase, get her fired up to no avail. He was a short and stocky man, wider than I was, and comported himself as a man who had done hard work all his life. A thick, dark mustache and hard-set eyes told me he was a hard-working individual who was not at all happy about having to call in an outsider to fix his problem. At first he attempted to follow me out into the dark, cold night to assist me, 
but after some coaxing from his wife, who shot me a worried glance, then seemed to check to see where the lights of my truck were pointed, she convinced her husband to stay inside and let the man do his work. He gave her a look that I can honestly only place as gratitude and grumbled his way back into the house to sit by the fire. I noted in that moment that the house itself was well lit with candles and battery-powered lights. Even the exterior was lit up. I was grateful for the wife telling him to leave me to my work. I can appreciate it when people want to learn how to fix things, but this was not the time. It's a lot easier to do my job without a watchdog lurking over my shoulder and offering unhelpful advice. Frankly, I've always worked better when left alone. After spending some time digging the generator out of its snow prison with only the headlights of my truck to guide me, I set to work on my diagnosis. Grabbing my impact driver from my tool bag and taking the valve cover off, I was confident that this would be an easy fix and I would be on my way shortly. One valve adjustment down and I was ready to start the motor. Just then, an error code popped up. Identification error. I stared at it for a moment, then looked to the sky to say, well, screw you then. Great. Now I have to update the software. It's not hard to do, just time-consuming as it starts with an 800-second countdown before the update can take hold. When you're outside in the snow after dark, those are 800 very long seconds. I fumble around in my pockets, and after some false starts, I get my flash drive plugged into the machine and begin the process. Because, well, you never get the USB right the first time. The timer begins. I'm standing in the cold, roaring wind, the display being the only source of light aside from my tiny flashlight. I make an executive decision to have a smoke while I wait. Normally, the company discourages any smoking on site, but I figure they aren't coming outside to yell at me anytime soon. So I light a smoke that I know the wind is mostly going to smoke for me, but at this point, who cares? Only 758 seconds to go. I trudge over to the electrical panel to see what circuits will go on first. It's odd, most people will put the well water, or maybe the AC, as the first system. But these people set the sodium perimeter lights as the first priority. Odd, but not all that odd, I suppose. After all, what use is anything else if you can't see what you're doing? And with all the wildlife roaming around in this part of the county, bears, mountain lions, and the like, it makes sense if you have any kind of livestock or house cats, or, you know, small children. I turn the headlights off in my truck as I no longer need them for shoveling, and why risk a dead battery way out here at this time of night? Another 554 seconds to go. Rather abruptly, the wind dies down, just stops. I was grateful. Thank God, I say out loud to myself. I might finally be coming to the part of the night when the snow just gently falls, instead of tiny ice missiles blasting my face all night. I unbutton the collar of my coat and shake my beard free. I keep working on my smoke as the countdown continues. I pushed my heavy hood laden with snow off my head for a break from the oppressive weight, and only then did I notice it. I noticed just how silent the area around me had become. The storm had been such a constant source of white noise that at first it felt welcome, a relief to have a break from the overbearing roar of sharp wind. That relief was short-lived, and a real feeling of dread began to set in. Silence in the woods is something mountain folk know better than to trust. There is no way to describe it unless you have felt it. Any hiker or hunter can tell you when everything goes quiet. It means a large predator is close by, hiding in the shadows or perched in the trees above and you would do well to be very aware of your surroundings, and if possible, carefully make your exit. I began scanning the tree line around me, and almost immediately saw something moving about just out of sight range. I squinted hard to try and make out the shape of it. The occasional brazen deer, and other mostly harmless wildlife, had been successful in scaring the daylights out of me in the past when I was least expecting them. So I told myself this was probably just a buck albeit a big one, moving through. But as I stared into the darkness of the forest trying to make out the shape of the creature in the shadows, I began to realize something. This wasn't a single creature. There were multiple creatures moving about behind the trees, just out of visibility. A herd of deer, maybe? Anxious, I glanced at the countdown. 345 seconds to go. Remember when I said 800 seconds could feel a lot longer? I had a sick feeling growing in my stomach, an instinct that something was horribly wrong, something dangerous. I stayed perfectly still as the shapes moved closer. 
I don't have the words to describe just how they moved from tree to tree, sticking to the dark patches, and as they moved closer I was able to see them in better detail, which didn't make things any less terrifying. As they approached and their shapes became easier to make out, they seemed like human figures for sure. Some tall, some short, almost like a whole group of people. But they couldn't be people, not out here in the woods in this weather. They certainly weren't deer. Their movement was shyly aggressive. They began to remind me of coyotes stalking a potential prey. 115 seconds left. I couldn't make out any detail yet. They all seemed to be cloaked in darkness that remained wrapped around them like a shadow, but darker, unnatural. I told myself not to panic. I'd been working double shifts for days. I was exhausted, and the contrast of snow in the dark can play tricks on your eyes. I tried to tell myself I was just sleep-deprived and was working myself up, but as they got closer, that got harder to convince myself of. I didn't want to take my eyes off of them, but I needed to plot out the best route back to my truck. Problem was, the truck was parked next to the barn, and where I was working on the generator, and I was shrouded in shadow from the lights coming out of the windows of the house. Thirty seconds now. The creatures seemed to fan out. It started to feel as if they were all around me, and they were swiftly closing the distance. I held my breath and took a few steps back, putting my back against the wall of the barn, and exhaled sharply as the fear I had been holding back shot up from my gut like a shot of electricity. Back to the wall my eyes dart from figure to figure, and that lizard part of my brain kicked in. I dropped my smoke to free both hands, and I distinctly remember hearing it hiss angrily as it made contact with the snow. I felt sweat begin to bead on my temples despite the freezing temperature. The muscles in my legs tightened, and I could feel the veins in my head pulsing, pushing blood past my ears in a steady thumping roar that mercifully blocked out the awful sound of the complete silence of the snow. Everything was slowing down and speeding up at once, and with all hopes of reaching the truck in time gone, I lifted my arms to block my face and squeezed my eyes tightly shut, braced for impact. Then, I heard it. I heard the click of the generator. It had finished its update and was now starting to sputter to life. The engine cranked so loudly I had to cover my ears, and in that moment, despite not putting much stock in prayer, I genuinely prayed that it would start, and maybe someone heard me because it did just that. With a cough and sputter, the engine came up to speed and began to purr, and with an audible snap, the transfer switch began to power on all of the outside lights to the house. I sucked in air. I apparently had stopped breathing. The nervous tension in my chest broke as relief washed over me and I opened my eyes. I wish to this day I never had. The lights came on slowly at first, a dim orange-pink glow bathing the scene around me a sickening hue. Eyes attempting to adjust to the new level of visibility, I leaned forward, squinting to see if the figures were in fact just figments of my imagination, a consequence of the exhaustion of too many days in crisis mode. I am wrong. As the light begins to chase away the darkness around me, the figures do not disappear with it. Once completely clad in darkness, they are now revealed and are very real. The light washed away the obfuscation around them like wind blowing away ashes. My mind tries to slog through the adrenaline dump and process just what it's seeing. They are just people, men, women, children. They're people, not creatures or predators. My emotional brain breathes a sigh of relief because, hey, it's okay. They're just human beings. Meanwhile, my logical brain is grabbing the wheel and screaming at me. Something's wrong. Pay attention. My eyes finally catching up, I look them over, trying to understand what I'm seeing. They gazed back at me in silence. Then it dawned on me, and I felt the blood draining out of my face. The clothes. They hung oddly on their bodies and certainly weren't intended for winter weather, much less a record-breaking snowstorm. Their clothes were ill-fitting and had the look of something homemade. Dirty overalls, hand-sewn pants, prospector hats. Did I just see a bonnet? They just stood there staring at me, silent as the snowfall and completely still. Zero seconds left, full power. The sodium perimeter lights kick on and bathes the entire property in sharp, relentless light, blinding me. My eyes fighting to make the transition from straining in the blackness to being bombarded with the sudden illumination. When the light hits the strange people in front of me, they change. It was as if the light itself ripped something from them, 
and I gaped in horror, unable to believe what was happening. All the people standing before me, men, women, and children, began to scream. These were no human screams. The shrill sound pierced my ears and reverberated through my core. It sounded like true agony coming from deep underwater. I covered my ears to block out the chilling sound, but my eyes remained fixed on the nightmare unfolding. Their clothes simply ripped away from them, as if scorched off by a fire I could not see. Then their flesh burned away as well. It tore away from them, ripped into fluttering ashes of red-hot agony. They stood in place, writhing and burning in agony for what could have only been a single second. Then they turned their contorted faces directly toward me. Their eyes. I will never in all my days forget their eyes, jaundiced and sick, human but filled with pure hate and rage. The one that had been closest to me fell to its knees and began to crawl towards me, its movements convulsing in torment and anguish. I fell backwards and landed hard on a landscaping rock. With pain shooting through my body, I scrambled to scoot backwards on my butt. The ghoulish figure stretched a smoldering hand out and I gasped out loud as it grabbed a hold of my foot, its grip too powerful to escape. Lifting its head with a tremendous effort, it stared into my eyes, filled with fury but almost pleading. Then it opened its gaping mouth to speak, and the words that shot from its mouth went right through me, haunting me for the rest of my life. With an expression of pure torture, it screamed, Get the children! I watched paralyzed as the light finally overtook the wretched creature, and it faded, crumbling into ashes and blowing away in the crisp night breeze. I was left there alone in the snow, my pounding heart beating right out of my chest. I looked down and noticed smoke wafting up from my boot. Suddenly I felt the searing pain of my toes, like the steel toe of my boot was on fire. Pain is a funny thing. Makes you forget absolute terror, at least for a second. It jolted me out of my shocked stupor, and I reached down and unlaced my boot as fast as I could, tossing it into the gleaming snow. It sizzled for a second like my cigarette did a lifetime ago, then began to sink into the widening hole around it in the snowbank. As I was jamming my foot into the nearest drift to soothe the searing sensation, all the lights in the entire house popped back on and I heard a sound coming up behind me to my left. Oh God, the family. They were no longer safely inside and since I had but scooted far enough toward my truck, I could now see the entrance of the home. The husband, wife, and two children had all emerged, a boy maybe around thirteen and a girl that looked around five, all standing on the porch holding firearms, even the girl peering out into the night. After what felt like an eternity, I stood and feeling suddenly sheepishly, I gathered my boot from where it had been thrown. I had no explanation for what had just happened, but tried my best to collect myself. I looked down at my discarded work boot and saw something that again, I cannot explain. A handprint seared into the leather where, whatever that was, had placed its hand upon me. I slipped it back on and gathered my composure. I was still on the clock and my professionalism overpowered my shock and disbelief at what had just happened. Climbing back into the cab of my truck, I located my clipboard and smoothed out the work order. I have no idea why I chose to do this. I think I just needed some sense of order. I clicked my pen open and wrote a concise description of the work I had performed. Having still not laced the offending boot and with little stabs of pain necessitating a slight limp, I awkwardly made my way back onto the porch, the family having apparently retreated back into the house while I focused on my paperwork. I rang the now operational doorbell and the husband quickly answered. Get it all worked out? He watched me closely, an inquisitive look on his face. I tried to steady the trembling in my voice and replied, Yes, sir. She is back up and running. He eyed me intently, searching my face for something, but I was all business. A hell of thing you guys do. Not just anyone would come all the way up here to fix something in this kind of storm. I cleared my throat. We try our best, sir, I answered, and finally sounded like myself, going through my standard lines. He continued to study me, which would normally make me uncomfortable but I was too spent to care. Why don't you just stay here tonight? We've got a nice couch to put you on, and the roads behind you are closed, and well... He hesitated for a second, contemplating. Well, you just really did us a real big favor, and we'd like to repay you. Come on in, we'll make you some coffee. You're probably frozen to the bone working out here. 
I faked a gracious smile, anxious to get as far away from here as possible. I appreciate that, sir, but I'll have to pass. I have more calls tonight. The man snorted, gesturing out behind them at the snow, which had begun to dump again, already covering my footprints from the truck to the porch. You ain't getting to them tonight, my friend. Don't be stupid. You're gonna freeze to death. Come on in. Let's get you in some dry clothes. He opened the door behind him and reached for my arm to pull me inside, refusing to take no for an answer. But I stepped sideways and just barely skirted his grip. I appreciate the offer, I really do, but power's out all across town. I have more people out there shivering in the dark that need me. He finally gives up, nods in defeat, and holds out his hand. I take it, give him a nod, and quickly return to my truck to check the weather forecast and wind map on my laptop. I actually really wanted to take them up on the offer, but I knew I shouldn't. We were in a crisis after all, and if there was any chance of me getting out to do more calls, I had an obligation to try. I sighed and pulled up my wind map. The wind map gives those of us the field a kind of a reference point for where the storm is doing the most damage. I studied it and then frowned, refreshing the image. Something was glitching. This map couldn't be right. Right where everything had occurred that night, on the south side of the property. There was a huge black spot, no wind. I refreshed a few times, the black spot remained, and more disturbingly, it was moving. Whatever it was that I encountered that night was not just a random occurrence, it was out there moving, like a living storm within a storm. Well, you just really did us a big favor and we'd like to repay the favor. Sorry, I have more calls tonight. You ain't getting to them tonight. I appreciate the offer, I really do, but I have more calls tonight. I walked back to my truck to check the weather forecast and wind map on my laptop. I actually wanted to take them up on the offer, but I know I should not. If there is any chance of me getting out to do more calls, I should try. Then I looked at the wind map. The wind map gives those of us the field kind of a reference point for where the storm is the worst. Right where the incident occurred on the south side of the property, there was a huge black spot of no wind. It was moving. Whatever it was that reached out that night wasn't just a random occurrence. It was out there moving like a living storm within a storm. I grabbed my phone out of my cargo pants and looked at the next calls. Well, you got work to do, I understand. Just take this, the husband says, as he presses a pack of road flares into my hand. I simply take them thinking nothing of it and run to my next call. The next ones were all along this road and right in this path. Right then a call came in on my work phone. Third call had figured it out for themselves. Call canceled. Okay, just one more. I can do this, just one more. I had them sign a work order and took off down the road. Panic has started to set in. I'm used to working under extreme circumstances, but this felt more urgent than anything I had ever done. I wound my way back down the long snow-covered road and then the inevitable happened. Road blocked, a tree down in my path. I sat in the truck, staring out at the tree. It was a small tree, but just enough to block my path. I could not risk breaking down, not now. The lights of the truck reached pretty far, and our emergency flashers were illuminating the darkness of the forest around me. I checked the wind map again. The darkness is all around me. It's here. Through the windshield I watch as the wind calms again and the shadows begin to appear. They stay away from the lights of the service truck, but I can see them moving about in the shadows just beyond. I need my chainsaw to clear this, I thought to myself. I looked again out the windows of the truck. Those black silhouettes were still out there just dancing around the lights of the truck. I got the sense then that they were waiting for me to run out of time. No, I said to myself. I gathered my will, smacked my nerves back into line, and said this is not how I am going to die. Then I peed myself a little and opened the door of the truck. I knew I couldn't step on the ground. Too many shadows. I climbed awkwardly over the cab into the bed of the truck to grab the chainsaw. It was half in darkness, half out. As I lowered myself into the bed of the truck, I had a sinking feeling. I reached a cautious hand for the saw. I let my finger touch at the edge of the saw, just testing. I reached out to grab the blade and pull it out of the shadows. At that moment, a little piece of the darkness around me reached out. A hand, but not a hand. Something without skin, without tissue, without a heart, without a soul. 
Something incredibly devoid of life and made of suffering touched me. The pain was incredible. I had enough wits about me to yank the chainsaw back into full view of the light. I pulled my hand away. I had the saw within my grasp. What more could I want? I looked down at my hand. Blackened finger marks lay across burned flesh. It touched me again. I yanked the saw away from the darkness and climbed back over the cab with the saw in hand. I slid down the cab windshield and planted my feet in front of the truck. Illuminated by the headlights of the truck, I felt a sudden invigoration. Just stay in the light. I walked out into the headlights of the truck and began cutting the fallen tree out of my way. All the while the darkness danced just beyond my lights, constantly fluttering in and out of my field of vision. The tree was easy work had it not been for the horrors that sat on the edge of my vision. Cut. Now grab the winch and pull it out of your way. As I fastened the winch to the tree, I could hear them all around me, the subtle movement of snow and tree branches, an almost angry growl punctuating my every move. I clambered back into the cab of my truck and threw the vehicle into reverse. With a small groan and a pants-ruining moment of trepidation, the tree moved. The road was clear. In my excitement, I ran to the offending tree to clear my ropes from it and go home. I then realized my error. The tree had pulled off to the side covered in darkness. I reached my hand to recover my winch, and then they came. All of them. They who had been waiting in the darkness came at once. When the first one touched my hand, I felt pain. When the second one grabbed my arm, I felt suffering. When the third one held me in its embrace, I felt agony. I fell backward trying to move into the safety of the headlights, but they came, and one by one laid a pair of terrible hands upon me. I fell back further. Once again, scooting backward on my butt, I made it to the door of the truck. They were all around my lower body at this point. The more I screamed in pain, the more resilient they became. My hand scrambled under the seat, around the back, on the floorboards, anywhere they could think to look for something to help. Then my hands happened upon something. I ripped open the bag, took one end off, and struck a road flare. I turned with my new flame toward my attackers. The light burned them. As it had before, they first seemed normal, then began to filter away in ashes. Their screams diminished, as did the pain. I lay there for a moment in the snow, waiting. They did not return. I sat bolt upright and scrambled for the safety of the truck. I could still hear their voices, muffled and distorted, but still all around me. I attempted to fish my keys out of my pocket, only to realize in a moment of pure frustration that the truck was still running. I leapt into the cab threw the truck in drive and tore my way out of the path of that darkness. Once back on a main road, I gathered myself, trying to make sense of what had just happened. That proved fruitless, so I just radioed into the home office saying I was taking the truck home and would be dispatching from home tomorrow. They confirmed and thanked me for all my hard work tonight, saying, Hey, take the day off tomorrow if you need some rest. I agreed to the offer and immediately headed to the nearest liquor store that was still operational. Securing my liquid therapy for the night, I began to head home down much more familiar and comfortable roads. I pulled into my driveway, and in a move decidedly unlike me, I immediately pulled a drink from the small bottle of whiskey I had just procured, then another. I went inside my home and was suddenly overcome with gratitude. My wife had built a fire. The very second she saw me, she knew something was wrong and asked kindly, What's wrong? I broke down. Tears streamed down my face as I tried to convey what I had seen. She is a kind woman, but not a superstitious one. She calmed me down and assured me that I had been working too many hours. She was well aware of my PTSD issues left over from my EMT days, and had seen me through some pretty terrible nights before. She talked me down from the ceiling and gave me dinner. I went to sleep that night only after I'd finished the entire bottle of whiskey. I don't know what I saw that night, but I do have a little follow-up. About six months after this incident, I was performing a service on a generator and got to talking with the owner. He was a part of a geological group that attempted to track down old towns and communities from the Gold Rush era. He was telling me about a small town of which there is almost no record of that existed around the area where my incident had occurred. He told me of a small community that had a schoolhouse. A wildfire had claimed the community and the schoolhouse. Excavation project had revealed the foundations and a few remains. However, the remains of the children and teachers had not been discovered. I felt a chill when he said this. 
I felt like I knew where those people had fled.